I know, kind of scary. So basically, I'm just going to go over a little bit of information about FMD chat, what's been happening over the past year. Uh, if anybody wants to tweet, connect, whatever, we are at FMD chat, and the hashtag we are using is FMD aware. So first, some kind of interesting or boring, depending on how you look at it, stats from our Facebook page about exactly how large of a community we're reaching. So far, we've got 605 likes from the Facebook page, which actually is up, I think, another two or three. And what's interesting is to look at our breakdown in gender, which we all know we are rather overwhelmingly female. But this also compares it in terms of ages to the rest of Facebook in general. And so you can see that we're really outpacing the norm with the 35 to 44 and 45 to 54 age range, which is largely our target market. So, yeah. These, I think, are really interesting breakdown of geography and language in terms of the areas that we're reaching. I think this is just so incredibly cool. We're obviously high in the United States, but then our international reach is totally showing up where we've got our patients from Italy, France, and these may not just be patients, these are people who are interested, doctors, providers, anything like that. Cities, Yay, Minneapolis showing up with <laughs> 10 fans. I, I wonder why. But we're also reaching out in various different languages, which is something that I try to be a little bit aware of in what we're posting and actually goes into our Rare Connect page, which I'll talk about in a minute. Norwegian. Yeah, Norwegian isn't doing so well. But, uh, our Rare Connect page is what's really helping us connect with that international audience. Rare Connect is a partnership between Nord and Eurydice, Eurydice being the European version of an organization for rare diseases in that all rare diseases are represented. We actually worked with Eurydice to develop the fibromuscular dysplasia community. And so when you go to this page, which is rareconnect.org, and you have, you sign in, you sign up, just like anything else, and you have a pull down menu so that you can select FMD as your community. But also, if you happen to be a patient of other rare diseases, you can enroll in those communities as well. And so with this page, it's sort of along the lines of another Facebook in that you've got the community forums, you've got resources. This, we really want it to be something that is a resource for the international community in that while things are posted by us in English, the cool thing is that these posts can be translated into other languages on demand. So, <laughs> so if you need it in Spanish, Italian, German, whatever, that's a service that they provide free of charge. And it works vice versa, that if a person happens to post in a different language, we can have it translated to English. This is talking about our web page, which I should have pulled up the comparison stats from last year, but looking at our reach internationally, again, we're drawing heavily from the United States, but we've got great representation, Australia, hello, Australia, so we've got some friends there that we know of, and this has been on a very steady uptick, so that even though we may not be posting on a very, very regular basis, the resources that are there, people are still making use of. And so this is where you can see that the page views, this is ranking our top ones of where people are going and what kind of information they're consuming. 
and I love the fact that the readings and resources, which are some of our clinical papers that we've linked to, that kind of stuff, but also the patient stories, and that's you guys. That's the patients reaching out to other patients so that people are really making a connection. Overall page views, 33,738. Not shabby. Page views last month were registering over 1,000. We are also on Twitter. Twitter has been a great resource for us in terms of connecting, again, internationally, because it works anytime, anywhere. We've been having, again, a steady uptick in followers so that we're at 719. The people that we're following, if that's anything that you guys want to look at, if you are on Twitter, we're connected with Society for Interventional Radiology and various different medical communities, universities, all this kind of stuff. And so that provides good resources for you guys as well in terms of actually connecting. We've been added to 37 lists which lists are something that users create of accounts that they want to follow. So Society for Interventional Radiology, Mayo Clinic Center for Social Media, Cardio Rad, which is a partnership between Cedar sinai and UCLA, and the UV Health System and Boston Children's all have us on their lists, so they're paying attention to what we're tweeting. This is the healthcare hashtag project, which is run by Simpler. The guys at Simpler are fantastic, and actually one of their founders had his own run-in with a rare disease, so he's a little sensitive to our community, which is awesome. What they've done is they helped us create this FMD aware hashtag, which the story behind is a little interesting. Um, previously, we have been using the hashtag FMD. FMD, I ended up finding out, is sort of a take on FML, which if you let your imagination wander, it includes a curse word and my life after it. And while that is somewhat appropriate for our disease, we still didn't think it was the greatest PR move. So instead, we changed it to FMD aware, which differentiates it from all those people who are simply having a very bad day. So you can look at the influencers of this hashtag. And so this is people who are using it, who are tweeting it out. And we've got people in the community who are not our patients. They are not necessarily part of our community, but we're part of their network because we've connected with them on Twitter. This is our newest endeavor and what is actually helping us live stream this event. This is our brand spanking new YouTube page. And so now on YouTube, we have a channel. The channel is something that we can use for events like this so that we do a live broadcast. We can also post videos such as the one that we created from last year's event. And we can curate videos so that we can use this as another educational tool so that I've gone through and created series of videos, not ones that we've created, but ones from around the web, and spent time really looking for ones that were informative and had a certain I don't know, appropriateness to them and had reliable information, because reliable information is something that can be a little difficult to get on the web. And so really making sure that the stuff that we're putting out there is something that people can really rely on. So we've got coping with caregiving, which caregiving is something that I think we really need to be paying more attention to as a community overall because we know what we need as patients, but what we need as patients is so often someone to help us. And so we need to make sure that we're helping our helpers. We also have some information about aneurysms, stroke, and transient ischemic attacks 
and some vascular and renal education. And these are, they range from very approachable to somewhat more technical so that there are some good anatomy videos and everything so that you can really learn your vascular system all that you want to in awesome 3D animation. So going on into what we've kind of done throughout the year, Rare Disease Day, always held on the last day of February. This year, I was actually fortunate enough to be able to go to Washington, D.C. and participate in the Rare Disease Legislative Advocates Day. So this, they actually provided a scholarship for travel, went up, participated in legislative training so that you can learn about policy, about the FDA, about all these really nitty-gritty things that people who are smarter than me really should be paying attention to, and they are, which is good, because a lot of it's over my head, but I'm learning. And you can see right here, FMD chat is thanked, and these were published in a roll call and on the hill, and went out to every single person on the hill, all the senators, all staff, all everything. It was an incredibly powerful experience, both in good ways and bad. Uh, one thing was that I got to actually meet parents of young children who have rare disease. And that was very interesting for me because I'm not one, and while I am someone's child, I tend to think of this more from an adult perspective. I mean, generally speaking, our disease, FMD, affects people much later in life. It's, it's not a child-type disease. We do have a few patients, but overwhelmingly it's not something that's diagnosed so young. And to really see what these parents go through in fighting for their children it, and having access to treatments that are available overseas but they're not available here and so they're taking out second mortgages and just doing crazy things to really procure the funding to get treatment for their kids that's not available here and that's it's frustrating to no end but I'm so glad that I was able to have that experience the, flip side of it was going to DC in realizing how big the machine is and how loud and how active you have to be to really be heard. That can be a little bit disheartening, but we had the opportunity to actually go and meet with congressional staff and I will say that out of all the groups, we, we had over a hundred rare disease representatives, parents, you know, people like me going, and we all broke out into groups based on states, you know, based on sort of legislative areas. And even though it may not be our representative, we still were from the same state and so would be talking to them. I would say that our group had the victory of making two staff members cry, which we were very proud of. Um, that's one thing that those sick kids have going for them is they will make people cry. Got to hang out with some great people, Jeff Lucic, who his child suffers from alternating hemiplegia of childhood, which kind of an interesting name, but it actually means that randomly various parts of his body will just go numb. And his son is very, very young, and what he said is that it's so hard for him because his, his son, you know, young enough to not communicate too terribly much, but what he'll say is, bye-bye. And it's an arm or a leg that he can no longer feel. And it will return, but it's just this sort of thing that happens that they can't really do much to control. The Histiocytosis Association of 
Association of America. Uh, it's Jim and Lisa there above me. Uh, they actually lost their son at age two. And, you know, those are the things that do put a disease in perspective that while we're here and while we, many of us, have suffered very serious events, we're still here. And so there was that nice little silver lining in it. Looking forward to Rare Disease Day next year. Again, it'll be on February 28th if you want any information about it. RareDiseaseDay.org. And hoping to actually go back and participate in this legislative event again. At the same time, while up in D.C., making good use of time and resources, got to go to the NIH. And FMD Chat was one of the organizations that had a booth available during the NIH celebration of Rare Disease Day. And so we were able to get information out to researchers and doctors and other patient organizations. And it was fun to talk to the other patient organizations and be like, oh, you guys have this? We have this too. And, and make some connections that way. But I think this was a two-day event. And man, we really moved materials. And so I, I was very, very happy about that. And I got really good at riding the DC Metro, carrying large bags of things. Then we got to have a little bit of fun with some stroke awareness and National Orange Popsicle Week, which if you haven't heard about the Popsicle Week, it's pretty cool. I stumbled across it, but young girl, you know, somewhere around about my age, uh, although she had her stroke a few years ago, and it was a pretty severe stroke. And when she woke up in the hospital, feeding to you, I mean, they're not letting her have anything to eat. And the one thing she wanted was an orange popsicle. But she couldn't have it until she passed a swallowing test. And so went through all these weeks of rehab and everything and finally passed that swallowing test and her PT person went out and bought an entire box of orange popsicles for her and her family. And it was the most awesome popsicle ever. And so she decided to create this National Orange Popsicle Week to raise awareness of strokes specifically in young people. We ended up successfully teaming with the University of Tennessee Medical Center and this super cool popsicle restaurant, if you can even call it a restaurant, called Pop Culture in Knoxville, so that we had UT providing blood pressure screenings for free. We had our own booth. You can see some of the orange popsicles that he whipped up specifically for the event. And it was great. It was a little bit of a kind of damp day, and so it wasn't like the best for eating popsicles. But we had good walk-up traffic and were able to provide a needed service to members of the community because they had forms such that if a blood pressure came back too high, they were immediately recommended to seek medical attention. And we actually reached some of the low-income members of the community, which I think was a really, really great service. And UT is very excited about partnering with us again next year to do this. So I'm looking forward to that. And we've also even talked about doing some other events with their Brain Spine Institute and their Certified Stroke Center. So then got to go back to DC. There's a lot of travel involved in this. But this was a pretty cool one because we actually got some pretty nice billing over here. You can see with the moderator, Veronica Combs of Med City. Uh, Suzanne Mintz, who is with Caregiver Action Network, 
They're a really interesting group. I would encourage you to connect with them. Adrienne Boise, who Cleveland Clinic, she's awesome. She's really awesome. She's a doctor who absolutely gets the emotional connections of disease. Me. And also Angie's List, which you know, I've always thought of Angie's list as being, okay, do I need an oil change? Do I need somebody to clean my house? Well, they're actually making a concerted effort to include medical communities in that as well. So, had my FMD bracelet on, represented on stage. And some of you may remember from last year, actually, me talking about Regina Holiday and the Walking Gallery, which the Walking Gallery is an art activist kind of movement. So that Regina, who actually, she lost her husband a few years ago, rather suddenly and due to some questionable medical failures, she is using her talents to kind of break down some of the medical walls and paints patient stories, provider stories, on the backs of business jackets. So that it's kind of like a mullet, business in the front, party in the back. This is my own story with the duality of me as the bride and also as afternoon napper, but me as a patient as well with the FMD chat logo in the middle and I I like a lot that uh, this figure looks so much like our friend Carrie. And Regina was painting at Med City Muse, but she wasn't originally invited, and neither was I. But we didn't really let that stop us. This was a conference about patient engagement, and when the agenda first came out, there were no patients on it, which didn't make a lot of sense. So I kind of called them out on it, and they said, well, we're still working on it. And they were, and so that's how I ended up being added to the schedule. Regina was in town for another event, and similarly ran into Veronica at that event, and she said, well, are you going to be painting at our conference? And Regina said, I was told that I couldn't. And Veronica said, well, we'll fix that. So. Regina ended up doing a great piece, and uh, unbeknownst to me, uh, I didn't quite see all the way through when she asked me if I would hold the painting while on stage, which I agreed to, and actually ended up in a very impassioned speech from Regina, which if you ever have a chance to meet Regina, she is a fierce little force to be reckoned with, and yeah, she's about my size. So, from that, I ended up writing a blog post about Regina, about the stories that ended up getting shared around and very much connecting with Med City Muses, Veronica Combs as well. So, that was just another good experience and good exposure for FMD Chat. Coming up at the end of this month, I get to give more speeches. They will be shorter. But going to Stanford Medicine X, this is a conference I've been involved in for a while now. And again, this is just good exposure for FMD Chat as I go as a representative from the organization and as myself and the speech that I'll be giving. I specifically talk about intimal fibromuscular dysplasia and the stroke that I had as a result. Then in October, because like I said, there's a lot of travel involved in this. We'll actually be traveling to Vancouver in Canada for the BC Kidney Days, which is a large renal conference, and working with uh, Dr. Jennifer Dyer, who she is actually a pediatrician who specializes, I think, in endocrinology. I'll, I'll have to double check on that, but she's been working a lot with social media and diabetes and getting teenagers to be compliant with their treatment using apps that provide rewards like mp3 downloads. That's kind of cool. I, I wish I'd get rewards for taking my meds, but no, I just 
get rewarded by not feeling bad. So this will actually be a plenary session, and I will be talking about all of you guys, social media and FMD chat. So looking forward to 2014, what do we want to do? As I mentioned, looking to that Rare Disease Day and participating in the Rare Disease Legislative Advocates event again, and what's something that we can do perhaps as a group. I nearly connected with some patients up in DC for this event. Unfortunately, we weren't able to this go around, but maybe that's something that we can plan on next year so that we have more patient representation. In accordance with our name, FMD Chat, we are implementing what I hope to be monthly chats on Facebook and Twitter. We've done one of these. It went extraordinarily well. Having everybody answer questions, focus in, come together. We had a great dialogue going on Facebook and at the same time had people chiming in via Twitter. It was just really awesome. Looking to do a website redesign so that we move a little bit away from the blog type format and more into something official as an organization. We are also still waiting on our 501c3 status. Everyone, please go shake your local IRS representative for me. This has been an excruciating process that is now really just waiting. And when I submit it in December, they were looking at applications from March of the previous year. So I've stopped holding my breath, but once that actually does come through, we will be able to be official NORD members as they require the 501c3 approval. Also, once those things happen, that's what will really allow us to move into doing something more research-based, funding research that already exists and or there's a big movement to actually focus on patient-centered research. What do patients want? What do patients need? What are the things that patients have noticed about their condition? And so that may be something that we could play off of in order to get some more symptom management because I know pain is something that so many of us complain about. Headache is something that so many of us complain about. and while we're making great strides on identifying genetic markers and all these other things, for those of us right now, managing the symptoms is really all we have. Also, want to talk, and we can do this informally later in the day, about FMD Chat 2014. On one hand, we love being here in Asheville. On the other hand, if we relocate it, it might provide an opportunity for other members to join us. So want to get your opinion on that. We'll talk, get feedback. And also thinking about trying to hit the fourth annual U.S. Conference on Rare Disease and Orphan Products. Again, something that is very much an educational opportunity because getting in on the policy side of these things and the pharma side of what actually goes into developing a drug or getting a drug approved for another use. There are complex things that go way beyond just traditional advocacy efforts. And so it's something that I'm trying to learn about as much as I can. And uh, anybody who wants to sign on to tackle that with me is more than welcome to. So that's really it for now. If you guys have questions, I'm happy to answer them for a few minutes. Otherwise, we can talk after the show. We good? Okay. So now it is my actually great pleasure to introduce someone who has done uh, what not a lot of doctors do which is um, listen and help. And he's my very own neurologist, Dr. Matthew Engelbrecht. So if you would please, sir, join us. Uh, 
Um, well, I appreciate you having me here. Um, and uh, just a little bit about myself before I start talking. I, uh, I've been here in Nashville for about six years, but I um, went to medical school at Loyola University in Chicago and then did bio neurology training at uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And <laughs> I went to undergrad at Duke, so <laughs> I know where my loyalties lay. Um, and uh, I wanted to talk uh, this morning a little bit about um, stroke and TIA. Um, stroke, I think, is something we all hear about. Some of you have a personal experience with it, I'm sure. Um, but um, you know, a lot of people don't really understand much about it and what a TIA is. So I have several goals uh, for this talk. Um, one is I want to go over what the basic definition is of a stroke um, and a TIA. Um, I also want to discuss some of the uh, common symptoms of stroke and I'll also mention some of the uh, less common symptoms as well um, because not everybody presents um, the same way. And um, because this is an FMD um, chat group, um, I did want to talk a little bit about um, how stroke differs a little bit in patients with FMD uh, than the general population. Um, another thing I'm going to address is, you know, because FMD is a um, condition that's um, much more prevalent in females than males, I want to talk a little bit about um, how stroke differs a little bit in females overall. Um, so just starting, what is a stroke? Um, so there's two major types of stroke. Um, the most common type is something called an ischemic stroke. Ischemic just means that there's a lack of blood. So ischemic stroke accounts for about 80% of all cases of stroke. Um, so what happens is that a blood vessel um, carrying all the nutrients and the oxygen that the brain cells need is blocked or closed off, or what can also happen is that it becomes narrowed enough um, that there's insufficient blood flow through the blood vessel and the uh, surrounding brain cells uh, start to die off. Uh, what happens in a stroke is that brain cells die. Um, blood vessels can get blocked off in a you know, couple different ways. Um, a clot can travel from another part of the body um, to the brain, or um, actually more commonly, blood vessels in the brain itself become gradually more narrowed. Usually that happens with uh, plaque buildup like from cholesterol and the like. Um, again, in FFD it's a little bit uh, different process. Um, if a clot uh, breaks off and travels up to the brain, um, some of the major places that that can happen from is the heart. Some people can have heart arrhythmias where their uh, heart doesn't um, beat correctly and they can have clot buildup. Um, some people can have heart failure that also can predispose to clot formation in the heart. Um, or um, sometimes people can develop clots in other parts of the body like in the leg or the lungs and a piece can actually break off and travel up to the brain. Um, the second main type of stroke is a hemorrhagic stroke, so that means a bleeding stroke. Um, and so that's when a blood vessel ruptures. Um, the rupture itself prevents blood flow to the brain. Uh, the blood that leaks out of the blood vessel can injure the brain cells directly. Um, and uh, 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 hemorrhage can occur for a number of different reasons. Um, aneurysms, I think we've all heard of that. There's something called vascular malformations, which I'll talk a, a little bit about. Um, medications can do it. Um, there are some medications that uh, predispose you to uh, bleeding, um, aspirin being one of the most common ones, um, not to make you all afraid to go out and buy aspirin because the risk of having a bleed is very low, but it is a little bit of a blood thinner. Um, high blood pressure is a big risk factor. Some people have blood clotting disorders. Their, their blood is not as uh, sticky as it should be, so um, you may have heard of something called hemophilia where somebody can get a minor cut and it just keeps bleeding and bleeding and bleeding. Those people are certainly at more risk for um, uh, hemorrhage in the brain, or sometimes they occur spontaneously, unfortunately. There's no clear reason. They just happen. Um, I just wanted to illustrate this a little bit. Um, um, to, to tell you how an ischemic stroke occurs, um, 
this is the big blood vessel, the carotid artery that goes up the front of your neck here. You can you feel it. You can feel your pulse bounding there. And um, it shows you a wide open normal carotid artery. Um, this is a disease carotid artery. This is one where there has been plaque buildup, cholesterol buildup, that type of thing. And you can see there's not as much uh, space for the blood to flow up. Um, one thing that can happen in an area like this is that um, either a little piece of the plaque or um, a blood clot can break off and travel up the blood vessel and it eventually reaches a point where it hits a small enough blood vessel that it, um, it closes it off and uh, then all the brain cells in that area start to die off and that's what a stroke is. Um, another situation that can occur is that if the plaque buildup is bad enough here, um, the blood vessel can actually close up right at this area and that prevents blood flow through the entire blood vessel. Um, as you can imagine, sometimes if that happens, then a very large area of the brain um, is affected and injured. Um, this is an illustration of an aneurysm. Um, there are several different types of aneurysms. The most common type is something called a berry aneurysm, so named because it looks like a berry on a branch. Um, uh, what happens is with an aneurysm is that there's an area of the blood vessel, the wall of the blood vessel, that's weaker and thinner than it should be. And so um, that area just gradually starts to pouch out. And as you might imagine, as it pouches out, the wall here becomes thinner and thinner. It's like if you're blowing up a balloon, um, the more air you put into it, the more thin the wall becomes and the more likely it is to pop. So um, eventually, you know, uh, the aneurysm can kind of reach a critical point where it just bleeds spontaneously. Um, uh, high blood pressure can sometimes uh, predispose somebody to bleeding from an aneurysm. Um, not, uh, not all aneurysms are created equal. There are some that are less likely to bleed than others. Aneurysm is certainly a case where um, size does matter. Um, the smaller the aneurysm, the less likely it is to bleed. Um, uh, that's why some people can have an aneurysm that's found just by mistake. They may be getting a scan or something for some completely different reason and they happen to have a small aneurysm and you can just watch it. You don't have to treat it right then. Um, one of the hard things about aneurysms is that um, in many situations they don't cause any symptoms until they bleed. And um, the most common symptom that occurs when they bleed is a really bad headache. Blood is very irritating to the tissues that surround the brain. Um, there are some situations where an aneurysm can actually um, be pressing on one of the nerves that comes out of the brain, and so you might actually be able to see symptoms of the aneurysm before it, before it ruptures. Um, but many times, again, they don't cause symptoms until they actually bleed. Um, a large number of aneurysms are found at autopsy. Nobody, you know, people didn't know that they had them for their entire life because they were small enough that they didn't cause any problems. Um, I talked about that thing called a vascular malformation. I just wanted to show you a picture of it. Um, uh, the the artery is the blood brain, uh, excuse me, the blood vessel bringing blood from the heart. The vein drains the blood back to the heart. Uh, usually there's an organized kind of network of blood vessels that connect the two um, types of blood vessels. Um, in this vascular malformation, those blood vessels are misformed, so you kind of get this, um, big, uh, this big conglomerate of misformed blood vessels that are more likely to bleed. Um, so um, a TIA stands for transient ischemic attack. So um, it's the exact same mechanism as with a, an ischemic stroke. Um, a blood vessel is blocked or narrowed enough that there's insufficient blood getting to a certain part of the brain and the brain cells start to get kind of stunned and that's why people will get um, symptoms. Um, but the big um, difference is that it's a temporary interruption in the blood flow. So uh, TIAs can last for anywhere from a few minutes to several hours at a time. Um, and by definition, 
the symptoms last less than 24 hours total. If it's going on for more than 24 hours, it's, it's not a TIA. It, uh, it's something else. Um, it's not a mini stroke. Um, again, I'll get on my um, soapbox about terminology a little bit. Uh, you know, lots of people refer to things as mini strokes. I refer to it in my practice sometimes just because it's easier to communicate sometimes with people by using that term. But um, I, I like to discourage it because uh, there's nothing mini about a stroke or a TIA. Um, I discourage anything that minimizes this. A, a TIA is a warning sign that somebody's at a risk for stroke. Once you've had a TIA, your risk for having a full-on stroke does increase um, substantially. And so I think sometimes when you use terms like mini-stroke, you know, people uh, can minimize um, the, the, uh, the importance of that. Um, it's the same way, you know, I have a lot of patients who come in and somebody's told them a long way they had a mild stroke. Again, there, is, there are people who have strokes that have more mild symptoms than others, uh, but um, there's nothing mild about a stroke ever. So, um, Because a TIA only causes temporary damage, um, it doesn't actually lead to any death of any brain cells. It does not show up on any, it does not um, lead to any changes on a brain scan. It doesn't show up on a CT scan or an MRI. Um, and uh, so we make the diagnosis just by the symptoms alone. Um, that can make it a little bit more tricky to distinguish it from some other things that can cause stroke-like symptoms, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, but if any of you, you know, ever had an episode like that, and then you get a scan back, and the doctor says, "Well, everything looks normal," it doesn't mean you didn't have something happen. It just means that there wasn't any permanent damage. Um, I want to go through some of the major risk factors for strokes. Um, Age is a big one, um, and no matter how healthy we are, um, the older we get, the more likely we are to have things like strokes and, and heart attacks. Um, that's just a part of uh, getting older. Um, history of tobacco use, obviously a bad thing that can lead to um, plaque buildup, um, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and diabetes. Um, are also big ones. Obviously, as you know, there are other risk factors, more unusual risk factors like FMD or blood clotting disorders and the like as well, but these are really the big ones. Um, and, you know, I always point out to people that, um, well, we can't do anything about age. I wish I could. Um, once I figure that one out, I'll let you all know. And, um, but all of these things are what we call modifiable. You can, you can have control over these things, um, whether it's through you know, quitting smoking or um, diet, exercise, and the like, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So I just wanted to go over some data regarding strokes. Um, so about seven, almost 800,000 people each year in the United States um, suffer a stroke. Uh, it is the number four cause of death in the United States. Um, 40% of stroke deaths occur in males and 60% in females. Um, I think that's a number that um, would surprise a lot of people. I think, um, and, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in a bit, but um, I think our impression is generally that kind of vascular disease is more common in males um, overall, um, and yet it ends up killing more females in the country. Um, the cost is huge, about $74 billion um, annually. Um, and that's not only the, you know, the initial stroke care in the hospital and the like, but um, of course the disability afterwards. Um, some people have a great deal of disability after a stroke and need um, um, fairly intense levels of care um, through their entire life, and that uh, costs a lot of money. Um, some more specific um, data regarding strokes in women. So about 425,000 women suffer stroke each year. It's about 55,000 more uh, than men. Again, it's, uh, it's more common in women, and that's not, um, I don't think that's well recognized. Um, the National Stroke Association and uh, Women's Health Organization um, did a survey about three years ago asking women about uh, what they knew about stroke, what the risks were for stroke, 
and they found that only a little bit more than a quarter of women um, can name more than two primary stroke symptoms. Uh, I couldn't find any similar, you know, survey looking at men. Men may not be any better than women at doing that, um, but it does give an indication that it's not something that's well recognized. Um, um, race, um, unfortunately, does um, play a role here too. African American and Hispanic women tend to have more strokes than Caucasian women, but are less likely to recognize stroke symptoms and risk factors. Um, and uh, that may be a failure at an educational level. Um, um, women are twice as likely to die um, from stroke um, than breast cancer. Um, and um, in that same survey that I you know, was mentioning earlier, majority of women believe that breast cancer is five times more prevalent um, than stroke. Again, I'm going to hop on my soapbox again for a second um, because I remember when I was in training, one of my uh, professors always had a little blurb at the end of her emails talking about the rates of uh, breast cancer in the female population and the rate of stroke. And of course, you know, pointed out that the rate of stroke is much higher. Um, and I just don't think that's recognized very well. And I don't say that to take away from what you know, breast cancer foundations have done. I actually very much admire that because they've really put it out there. I mean, it's everywhere and they've been able to raise a lot of money. Um, it's just that I wish um, things like vascular disease, stroke, heart attack receive the same amount of attention, um, the same amount of publicity, and the same amount of money um, in the end result. So go out and Spread the word, if you would. Um, so uh, this is just a map that shows the um, death rates by county in the United States. Uh, dark purple is bad. Um, if any of you live in the southeast, uh, we live in what's called uh, the stroke belt. Um, and there's actually this kind of strip in the uh, covering parts of North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia that's called the buckle of the stroke belt because of the particularly high rates there. Um, nobody quite knows why that is. Um, you know, there have been theories about there may, may be some financial issues, uh, levels of education, um, access to care, um, and uh, the diet. Um, but I've lived in other parts of the country. The South does not have a monopoly on eating terribly. Um, I, I lived in Minnesota, and I have a lot of um, relatives in Wisconsin. And yeah, you know, we eat cheese and bratwurst when we go up there. So, um, but the rates aren't nearly as high in the Midwest as you'll see. So, uh, it's not clear what it is. Um, I read one. Yes. Isn't also very high uh, racial demographic difference? Yes, there is, um, and that may be why you see some of these same high stroke rates reflected in urban areas and other parts of the country, but not all of them. Um, for instance, you know, New York City um, has a relatively low rate, um, but yes, that is that does play a role. Um, I read one interesting article that hypothesized that it's the red clay soil here, that somehow it gets into the food and does something to it. I don't know if I believe that. Um, but I did read another interesting article that if you're raised in this area, your stroke risk goes with you. Um, so it doesn't matter if you move to another part of the country, you have the same, um, you have the same stroke risk, which I thought was fascinating. But we see that in some other disease states as well. Um, so I wanted to go over some of, some stroke symptoms, um, and stroke can cause a huge variety of different symptoms. You could almost ask you know the question, hey, can stroke do this? Can stroke do that? And the answer is almost well, sure it could. It may not be likely to, but but it could. Um, so I, I I first wanted to cover some of the really common ones, and I'm going to go over some of the less common ones as well. So. Um, a big one, sudden numbness or weakness in the face, arm, or leg, um, especially if it's only occurring on one side. Most of the time when somebody's having a stroke, they're not going to have symptoms on both sides of the body. Um, there are some exceptions to that, but most of the time it's going to be one-sided. Um, 
sudden confusion, trouble speaking, or understanding. Um, the trouble speaking can come in a um, kind of a variety of different flavors. So um, one of the most common things is slurred speech. Um, somebody's able to um, speak co coherently or come up with a coherent sentence, except they can't enunciate, so it's more difficult um, to understand them. Um, some people have strokes that affect the language areas of the brain. So um, they may not be slurring their speech, but they just can't produce speech um, the way they should. Um, they may only be able to produce a couple of monosyllabic words, or um, sometimes they can speak very fluently with a normal cadence and inflection, uh, except everything they come, that comes out of their mouth um, is nonsense. It's made up words. It's words that are mixed together. Um, uh, you can have trouble with understanding as well. Um, sometimes you can have a stroke in the part of the brain that has a lot to do with language comprehension. So um, they may, the person may be able to actually produce a normal sentence, but they can't really understand any, anything anybody's saying to them. And so, as you might imagine, those people end up sounding very confused because they may be responding or saying something that has nothing to do with what you just asked them. Um, Sudden trouble seeing um, in one or both eyes. Um, again, it, um, uh, sometimes people can completely lose vision in just one eye, and the other eye is fine. Um, some people, sometimes people can lose vision just on one side of their vision, so they may not be able to see anything on the right side. Um, sudden trouble walking, uh, dizziness, loss of balance, or or loss of coordination, um, and sudden severe headache with no known cause. Um, one comment I'd like to make about this, the first word is sudden in all of these, so um, stroke is certainly something where usually you're fine one minute and you're not fine the next, or um, another common thing that we'll, we'll hear is that somebody goes to bed at night and they're fine and then they wake up in the morning and, and they have these symptoms. Um, there are um, a few cases where the stroke symptoms can kind of build up more gradually, but almost always it's a, it's a quick change. Um, the, um, just a comment about the headache, so um, emphasizing the phrase with no known cause, um, you know, especially in the FMD population, it's females usually between the ages of 20 and 50, um, that's the same demographic where migraines are extremely common. About 18% of all women in the United States have migraines. And so if um, someone has a history of migraine and all of a sudden they get a rip-roaring headache, um, um, it's probably, even if it's more severe than their previous migraines, it's probably a migraine. It's probably not a stroke. If somebody has no history of headaches at all or you know, if they get you know, mild tension headaches like most of us do every once in a while and then they have what they describe as the you know, worst headache of their entire life, it's just they're grabbing their head and they're in agony, that's, that's a situation that's a little bit more concerning. But you know, again, honestly, it's hard to tell sometimes um, between what's a migraine and what could be the sign of a bleed. Um, so I, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the uh, kind of the specifics of these symptoms um, because um, I always, when somebody comes in and says they have numbness, I always have a series of questions I ask to try to define that because um, people define the, you know people define these symptoms differently. Um, numbness to me uh, consists of a complete or partial loss of sensation. That means you know, if my arm is numb and I touch my arm, I can't feel it as well as I can on the other side. Um, to me, that's a little bit different than somebody who gets kind of a pins and needles feeling like when your foot falls asleep. Um, that's, a, that's a little bit different. Or, you know, sometimes people will say, you know, I feel hot or cold somewhere. That's a change in sensation, but again, it's not a loss in sensation, and that's a change in sensation like that is less likely to be a sign of a stroke. Um, Weakness to me means a loss of strength. Um, when I ask people about weakness, a lot of times I'll ask the question, well, what can't you do because of the weakness? Um, because, say, your arm's weak. Um, people will tell me, well, you know, I, I try to comb my hair and I just can't keep my arm up. 
or um, your leg's weak, you're walking around along and you're dragging it, or particularly if a leg is weak, um, if you're walking upstairs, that can be difficult because it's hard to push yourself up or if you find you're tripping or dragging um, one foot. Um, and again, that to me means, you know, it's different than something like heaviness. A lot of people come in complaining as, of heaviness of their limbs, but they can still do everything that they normally can do. Um, it may feel like to them that it takes more of an effort, um, but if they can still, if they're still active and they're not, you know, dragging or they can still hold their, you know, arm up, um, that means that they're probably not weak. Um, the same thing goes with decreased endurance. You know, a lot of people say they're weak because, well, you know, I give out more easily. I can't walk as long as I could before. Um, sometimes that's due to weakness, but there's so many things that can cause decreased endurance, like problems with the lung or the heart or and the like. Um, that decreased endurance itself is not likely to be a sign of a of a stroke. Um, I mentioned, you know, earlier that um, the vision changes. Um, that occur with strokes sometimes can occur in one eye, sometimes it's a loss of all the vision. Um, we all have a blind spot in our vision that we don't really notice because our brain compensates for that, but sometimes that can get larger and so somebody can see kind of like a hole in their vision. Um, or uh, loss of part of vision in both eyes, again, this is a situation where you might not be able to see on the every, anything on the right. Um, it doesn't matter if you cover one eye or the other. Um, the right side will be gone, or uh, double vision. Um, and uh, what can happen is that there are some strokes that affect the muscles that control the alignment of the eyes. So if, if, one eyes, if the muscles are weak, one eye may be um, uh, looking straight forward, one might be turned to the side, and so they're both seeing slightly different images. Um, they're not looking at the same thing, and so the brain has a hard time making that fit, and that's when people see double. Um, these, are, these are some less common um, symptoms of stroke. Um, I still wanted to mention them um, just so you're aware of them, but I also, again, wanted to emphasize that um, uh, there are many other reasons that um, people can have these other things that are not stroke. So loss of consciousness, having a fainting spell. Fainting is almost never a stroke symptom. If somebody faints because of a stroke, they're usually going to have a lot of other stuff going on. Like they're gonna, their speech is going to be slurred. They'll be seeing double. They'll be not able to stand up. Um, just fainting on its own is almost never a stroke. Uh, memory loss. There are certainly you know, parts of the brain that have a lot to do with memory function and those areas can be stroked out just like any other area of the brain, but just um, pure memory loss with no other associated physical symptoms, uh, again, is relatively unlikely to be a stroke. A lot of people who've had a stroke, though, have memory loss afterwards as a complication of the stroke. Um, severe nausea. Again, not particularly common, but there, there are parts of the, um, what's called the brain stem, that's the part, bottom part of the brain where if you get a stroke, uh, it can make you really sick to your stomach. Um, um, we all learned from experience. When I was in my first year of training, I had a patient who had already had a stroke. I was seeing her in clinic. All of a sudden, she started getting really sick to her stomach and started throwing up. Um, she hadn't been feeling so well for the few days before, and I thought, okay, well, she has a GI virus or something like that, um, but she just kept throwing up and throwing up, and so eventually I took her down to the emergency room and we did an MRI, and sure enough, she had had a stroke. Um, so that was a good education for me. Um, generalized weakness um, can happen from a stroke. Again, that bottom part of the brain, if there's a stroke there, you can get weakness on both sides, but it's fairly unusual. Um, it, um, if all the limbs are involved, it's almost always something outside of the brain that's causing that. Um, and then limb pain. So, um, you know, there are reported cases of people, you know, developing pain in an arm or a leg, and that is a stroke. I do want to emphasize that this is rare. Most strokes are painless, with the exception that it, they can cause headaches. The bleeding type of stroke in particular can cause headaches. Most strokes do not cause pain, so 
Um, this is something that comes up, I find, is that people will have the sudden onset of pain in an arm or a leg, and they'll be justifiably worried about that, um, but they'll be worried that they had a stroke, and it's probably not a stroke. Um, um, this is, you know, an interesting list of um, uh, stroke symptoms that are relatively more common in women. Just like women are more likely to have some different um, heart attack symptoms, they're more likely to have some different stroke symptoms than men. Um, sudden facial pain, um, sudden hiccups, interestingly, again, there's a certain part of the, the brain stem um, where an injury can cause hiccups. Um, uh, chest pain, actually, and heart palpitations. So that means when your heart feel like it feels like it's skipping a beat or going out of rhythm. Um, again, I don't want I don't want you to freak out the next time you get the hiccups. Um, that's not likely, you know, to be a stroke if that happens. Um, and you know, by the same token, if you have chest pain, that's something to take seriously. It's not likely to be a stroke. It's more likely to be you know, acid reflux or, or a heart problem or the like, but um, it is something, you know, to always remember that if you have it, it's new and it's persistent, it's worth it to see a, a doctor about it. Um, I wanted to spend a little time on dizziness because dizziness means so many different things to different people. Um, I think at some point we've probably all been dizzy at some point, some, you know, we've used that term to describe ourselves, but um, it can mean a lot of different things. So lightheadedness um, is a common thing. Uh, Swimmingheadedness, I, I um, didn't know so much about that before I moved to the south, but a lot of people are swimmingheaded and just kind of feel like, you know, things aren't working right in their brain. Um, uh, the head rush feeling, we've all had that if we stood up too quickly and, you kinda, and it goes away very quickly, um, but some people kind of have that feeling all the time. Um, Spinning sensation, so that's that's classically what vertigo is. When we use the term vertigo, uh, it feels like the room is spinning around you, the rest of the world is spinning around you, or the rest of the world may be standing still and you're spinning on your own. Um, and uh, any kind of feeling of imbalance, one of the things some people will describe to me is they kind of feel like they're on the deck of a boat and the world's kind of tilting against them and they just can't find their equilibrium. Um, of, of these, you know, possible descriptions of dizziness, and, and that's not it by, you know, that's not the whole list by any stretch. Um, the two that are most concerning to me is when somebody describes vertigo, so again, they have that frank spinning sensation, or if they have the feeling of imbalance. They're just, you know, when they get up and walk, they're veering from side to side. They're having to steady themselves on the walls or on furniture um, because both the vertigo and the imbalance can be due to strokes in certain parts of the brain. Uh, vertigo in itself can be a tricky um, thing to nail down just because strokes can cause it, but a number of other things can cause it, like inner ear problems, for instance. And so... Um, Many times if somebody has vertigo, um, just in isolation, they don't have any other symptoms, then it's very unlikely to be a stroke, and it's actually relatively unlikely to be any kind of brain problem. Um, the, uh, um, if the vertigo is accompanied by things like slurred speech or double vision, that becomes a lot more concerning. Um, so... Um, the American Stroke Association has come up with this acronym, which is, I think, you know, uh, a very useful thing um, to keep in mind. Um, and I just wanted to go, th you know, through it here. The acronym is FAST. Um, F stands for face. Um, if somebody's, you know, saying they're not feeling well or they, they feel weak, you can ask them to smile. Um, oftentimes with a stroke, you know, even if their, you know, face isn't visibly drooping, if you ask them to smile, one side will clearly not elevate the same way that the other one does. Um, um, a for arms, ask the patient to raise both arms. Um, so th this we do in the hospital all the time. So you have your arms, ask the patient to have their arms out like this. And um, if they're weak on one side, they'll just kind of slowly drift. Um, and um, you know, I should use that as a as a way to illustrate the fact that if somebody has a stroke and somebody has weakness of the stroke, most of the time they're not actually paralyzed. It's 
you know, I think we've all seen or, or heard of people who just couldn't move one side of the body. That's not necessarily always the case with strokes. Some people aren't able to move as well. They don't have the same strength, but they still have some strength. And that's why this test can be very helpful, because that can pick up some of that more subtle weakness. Um, obviously, if you try to ask them to do that and they can't even lift up one arm, that's um, equally alarming. Um, S is for speech. Um, ask the person to repeat a simple phrase. Um, I always use no ifs, ands, or buts, um, because that actually, strangely enough, even though it's short words, it, that's actually a difficult sentence to put together or a phrase to put together for the brain. Um, and so, again, what you're listening for is, is there any um, lack of enunciation? Is there any slurring? Or um, does it all come out garbled? Um, or maybe they're able to just repeat one of the words. Um, they'd just be able to say no, but they just can't seem to get it, the rest of it out no matter how hard they try. Um, that's certainly alarming. And, um, and then T for time, you know, if you see any of those things, um, it's a good reason to call 911. Obviously this acronym, you know, doesn't take into account some of the other symptoms like we, that we talked about, like, like dizziness or headache and the like, so it doesn't make those any la less important. But there actually have been some studies that have been done looking at the use of this acronym in, in people out in the community identifying people have strokes, and it's actually helped. It's, it's improved stroke care. Um, because um, getting somebody with these symptoms to a hospital is very important. There are some treatments for stroke um, that can be done in the early going. Um, for a long time, there was one treatment that you had to administer within three hours of the onset of the symptoms. Um, there are some other treatments that have come along that have pushed that window out a little bit, um, but it's still, so it's really important to get somebody to the hospital. Um, a story I hear a lot is, well, you know, my arm kind of felt weak and numb, and so I went and took a nap because I hoped that when I woke up, it would all be, you know, better. And then you've, you've lost your opportunity. Um, so um, uh, it is important to just act on it. You know, another thing I always tell people is that um, if you go to the emergency room and everything's cleared up and you're feeling fine and all your tests come back normal, I'd much rather have you there having normal tests than sitting at home crashing. Um, um, so it's okay. It's okay if you're worried to go. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what we call stroke mimics. These are things that can act like stroke but that are uh, completely different. Um, and um, first off to talk about migraines, like I said, we're talking about um, a condition that's very common in the same demographic where FMD is common. Um, people with migraines can have something called an aura. An aura refers to any neurologic symptom that can happen because of a migraine. The most common type of aura is some type of visual change. Um, classically, people will get flashing lights or zigzag lights or it looks like they have kaleidoscopes in their vision. Um, but auras can consist of vision loss, so you can lose vision out of one eye, you can lose vision in part of your visual field, uh, you can get numb on one side, some people are completely paralyzed on one side of their body because of their auras, some people can't produce speech the right way, everything comes out garbled. So all the same things that we were talking about that stroke can do, migraine can do. Um, and as you might imagine, that can kind of make the diagnosis very confusing. Um, one of the characteristics of uh, migraine auras is that they'll last anywhere between 5 and 60 minutes. So again, same kind of time period that you see with the TIA. Um, but shortly after the symptoms go away, somebody will develop a migraine headache. And you know, if you have migraines or if you know somebody with migraines, usually it's a pretty bad headache. You're in a dark room. You might be nauseated and throwing up. So... That's, that's the easiest way to distinguish between a stroke and, an, and a migraine aura is that a headache comes afterwards. Um, some people have auras and never have a headache, or if they have a headache, it's only very mild. Um, and if you can imagine, that's even a more difficult situation to diagnose because then you don't have the clue of the headache to tell you what's going on. Um, it's more likely to be an aura if somebody has the same symptoms over and over and over again, what we call a stereotyped pattern, um, 
and they never have any permanent residual symptoms because it's unlikely that a TIA would happen over and over and over again without eventually leading to a full-on stroke. So, um, but again, the two things can look very much alike. Um, seizures, um, you know, usually when we think of seizures, we think of people dropping to the ground, convulsing, foaming at the mouth and the like, and that's one common type of seizure. Um, there are seizures that are called partial seizures because they only affect part of the brain. So um, somebody with a partial seizure may not lose consciousness, and um, you can have a conversation with someone who's in the middle of a seizure, but they're not going to be with it. Um, they're, you, know, you might ask them something, and they might be very slow to respond, or um, their speech might be very slurred. So again, it can look a lot like a stroke. Most seizures last three minutes or less, and again, they tend to be stereotyped. They tend to happen again and again and again in the same um, in the same manner. Um, but sometimes it takes a lot of further testing to try to um, tease that out. Um, low blood sugar can do it. Um, somebody with a really low blood sugar can look exactly like they've had a stroke, and they can be pretty out of it. Um, except all you need to do is get some orange juice into them, or if if it's bad enough and they're in the emergency room, they'll usually give them sugar through an IV, and that can make them pop right back um, to normal. Um, these, aren't, these aren't the only examples out there, but um, they're some of the more um, common ones um, that we have to try to figure out sometimes. Um, so um, just to talk a little bit about stroke in FMD specifically, um, and uh, these are some data that were um, published by the U.S. Registry for FMD. I didn't even know that um, existed until I uh, was preparing this talk, so you guys may know all about that. Um, but um, about 19% had had a TIA or stroke at some point. 19% um, had experienced something called an arterial dissection. Well, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit because that's something that's a little bit more specific to to FMD. 17% um, had an aneurysm, and again, these weren't all necessarily people who had had a symptomatic aneurysm. It's not necessarily that they, an aneurysm had ruptured, but some, somewhere in the course of their testing, they had been found um, to have an aneurysm. Um, and so the most common presenting symptoms so far, and I think there were 550 or so people in the registry so far, um, most common presenting symptoms which led to diagnosis were high blood pressure, headache, and pulsatile tinnitus. So um, high blood pressure, that's because of the effect that FMD can have on the arteries that go to the kidneys. Um, um, headache, um, again, it's not really clear whether the FMD and the headache are related or not. Um, um, what um, happens in many situations is that somebody may come in with aches and then just by chance the FMD is found. So um, at, it's not clear as far as I know that the two are related necessarily. Um, pulsatile tinnitus, so tinnitus is um, just kind of a general term for any kind of abnormal sound that someone hears. The most common is ringing in the ears. Almost everybody's experienced that at some point. Um, but uh, pulsatile means that um, there's a, a pulsing characteristic to it, usually that accompanies the heartbeat. And so um, kind of the most common um, symptom would be something like a whooshing sound, just a whoosh whoosh that somebody hears on the inside of their head it's not that everybody else can hear it um, around them. Um, and I actually was very interested to see that these were the most common presenting um, symptoms because if you look at the literature, even going back just you know four or five years, almost invariably it says that the common presenting symptoms are high blood pressure and stroke. Um, but um, most of these people were found before they had actually had a stroke, which is a good thing overall. Um, but it means that to me, it was just a good illustration that there's so much more to learn about it. Um, uh, men were more than twice as likely to have a dissection or an aneurysm than women. Um, as far as I can find, nobody really had an idea or a hypothesis as to why that is. It just was a thing they found. Um, women were more likely to have symptoms related to disease of the carotid arteries. So again, that's the big blood vessel here in the front of your neck. Um, 
a couple of things that can happen to the carotid artery are that you can get this dissection, and again, I'll explain that in a second. Or if there's um, if there's any kind of disease in the carotid artery where you have the narrowing of the blood vessel, you can get that tinnitus. Um, if the blood vessel is narrowed or irregular, the blood flowing through it is very turbulent, and so it, it makes no, more noise. Um, it's like going through a rapids on a river. Um, that water makes a lot of noise, and that's why you can sometimes hear the flow um, as this pulsatile tinnitus. Um, and then again, no huge surprise, 91% of people on the registry are female. Um, so I mentioned that arterial dissection, just to explain that a little bit. Um, so that occurs when a tear develops in the inner lining of the blood vessel. The blood vessel, the wall of the blood vessel is made of several different layers, and when that inner lining comes free, um, that's when you get the dissection. And then blood um, enters the space between the inner lining and the outer lining of the blood vessel, and that leads to the blood vessel becoming more narrowed. Um, just as an illustration of that, um, so this is this is a normal. Again, we're looking at this carotid artery here. This is a normal um, blood vessel, just like a tube. Um, here, you can see that the inner lining has torn off, and that there's blood um, moving into the space between the inner lining and the outer lining. And because of that, of course, the um, the area where the blood can flow has become uh, much more narrowed, and sometimes it leads to complete uh, closure of the blood vessel. Um, another thing that can happen sometimes is that when the blood clots in this area, a piece of it can break off and, um, again, travel further up into the brain um, and, and lead to a stroke. Uh, the two main blood vessels in the, in the um, brain and the neck that can be affected by a dissection are, again, that big artery in the neck, the carotid, and then a smaller artery that kind of runs up the back of the, the neck um, called the vertebral artery. Um, I wanted to say a few words about stroke prevention. Um, you know, again, it's, it's tough because FMD is a, is a um, kind of a different animal than most um, cases of stroke. FMD is a disease of the blood vessels that just, it happened. Um, whether it's, um, you know, it's a genetic predisposition or the like, um, uh, there are changes in the caliber and the, the walls of the blood vessel, and you can't really, as to this point, we don't know what to do about that. It's just there. Um, that doesn't mean that, you know, um, taking steps to try to prevent strokes and live a healthy life, you know, aren't, aren't important. So nutrition, what we put into our bodies, is a huge part of preventing strokes for anybody. Um, and I don't think there are any, you know, surprises on this list. Um, uh, eating lots of fruits and vegetables is, you know, important. Um, eating less cholesterol, less fat. Um, trying to avoid things that have added sugar, uh, limiting alcohol. So um, many of you may be familiar that there have been some studies looking at the beneficial effects of alcohol, especially things like red wine, and I think that's real. Um, most of the studies, unfortunately, have shown that you only need about a half glass or so to get the benefits from it. So the more you drink, it's not the health, you don't get more healthy. Um, it was also tragic that um, there was a study that was recently published looking at the um, healthy benefits of eating dark chocolate. Um, but again, you only need to eat about a square that big per day to get the health benefits. So yeah, so um, the chocolate industry needs to get in on that. Um, uh, if you're going to eat meat, you know, fish and lean meats you know, definitely are good. Um, somebody summed it up for me once, more plants, fewer animals. That's just an easy way to kind of go through your life and go through the grocery store. Um, so I think that's a good summation. Um, physical activity is obviously very important. Um, some kind of regular cardiovascular activity. Um, something you enjoy. Again, nobody's going to get up at 5.30 before work in the morning to do something that they hate, um, even if they think it's good for them. Um, 
there are lots of different activities that people can do and you know I always tell people it doesn't mean you have to train for a marathon um, nor do you have to be dripping with sweat at the end of it. Um, my sister has devised this uh, dance workout that she does specifically to avoid sweating. Um, she hates it um, but um, but it's worked really well for her. She lost all her pregnancy weight and she looks really good and she's very healthy and happy and so um, um, it is important um, to try to find something that you look forward to doing. Um, the current uh, recommendation is that you're doing that at least four days a week, you know, 30 to 45 minutes on those days, so um, sometimes it can be a struggle to fit that into the schedule, but it's worth it. Um, I always recommend doing some weight work. Um, it's good for bone health um, to do some strength activity. Um, muscle also burns a lot of energy. Muscle burns a lot of calories, um, and you don't have to be a bodybuilder to increase your muscle mass a little bit, and that actually increases your overall metabolism. So um, I always think that's a good idea. Um, there are medications, you know, that can help too. Um, if somebody's had a stroke, oftentimes we'll put them on aspirin um, as a first step in helping to prevent a stroke down the line. Um, aspirin actually decreases the the kind of the stickiness of some blood cells called platelets. These are the blood cells that help heal us when we have a cut. They're the, they're the first blood cells that start to close the cut and make the scab and the like. So um, what aspirin does is it inhibits the activity of those um, platelets a little bit so that your, um, hopefully your blood's flowing more freely. It's not getting um, clogged up or anything. Um, Plavix and Agronox are prescribed prescription medications that do the same thing, that they're a little bit um, more potent. Um, there are some people who end up on blood thinners for certain conditions because they really um, need a very strong medication to make sure that their blood's not clotting up. Um, and then uh, risk factor control. Like I said, you know, near the, um, near the beginning, most of the major risk factors for stroke um, are under your control to a degree. Um, um, uh, diet and exercise can have a huge impact on blood pressure control, making sure your blood sugars are normal, making sure your cholesterol um, stays in the right range. Um, there are, of course, exceptions to that. Um, sometimes we have bad genes and there's nothing we can do about it. Um, one of my friends in medical school was the healthiest person I've ever known. She was a vegetarian, she ran marathons, and her cholesterol was through the roof. And she had on medication since she was 15 and that just ran in her family and as much as she tried to live a healthy lifestyle she needed to be on medication to um, keep it at a healthy level and, and so medications do play, have a role to play here. We can do a lot to kind of modify those things and improve them but some people do need help from medications and um, you know one last thing Definitely having a primary physician that you're established with um, is very helpful. I'm the typical doctor. For a long time I didn't have a doctor because I thought I was invincible and nothing would ever happen to me. Um, but I've recently started to feel old and so I've gotten a doctor and um, it's, just, it's just very helpful to have somebody who's going to talk to you about it again and screen for some of these basic things, making sure that your cholesterol is not going the wrong direction, making sure your blood pressure is okay and the like. And also someone who knows you um, when you're healthy so that if something bad happens, um, they can see the difference. Um, that, that sometimes to me makes um, all the difference in the world. When I have a patient who I've been seeing for a while and something new happens and I can compare them in my mind to what they were like before, it actually helps me to really understand what they're going through and the way they've been knocked down by whatever happens. So... Um, so, yeah, that's my last plug. I think that's it. And that's, yeah. So, um, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy. Um, yes. As someone with multiple dissections and uh, okay. stroke, yeah. uh, what I wanted to mention was um, prevention for our care dissections. Mm -hmm. yeah. On our list, the main ones are new chiropractic neck adjustments. Right. That thing that goes when you do the been to a chiropractor, uh, extreme yoga where you're doing headstands, 
weird neck things, a very deep tissue neck massage where they're like pulling, trying to stretch your like neck from your body, and then also a hair a sadly and then a hairdresser syndrome. When they put your head in that um, mm -hmm. wash basin, uh, most of the people on our uh, virtual dissection sites, we all have them put extra pads or towels on that thing because if they put your head down and pull it back too hard, if your arteries have the propensity to dissect that particular yeah. hand. Yeah. And then the other one on stroke prevention for women of childbearing years, uh, there's so many that are discussing uh, birth control um, pills as being yeah. one of their right. uh, risk factors that right. that's what causes their chronic. Right. Um, you know, to comment on that, um, you're right. Um, uh, hormonal therapy, especially estrogen-containing hormonal therapy, does increase the risk of having blood clots, especially if you smoke. Um, and um, there is a lot of discussion about how much of a risk there is, especially with some of the newer birth control medications, because some of the some of the warnings are based on studies that were done with some of the older birth control medications that had much higher estrogen levels, um, but it's still something that we tell people to stay away from, especially if they've had a history of a stroke or a TIA. Um, you know, establishing whether that was the cause or not is always a little bit more tricky, um, primarily because the, the clots that tend to happen because of hormonal therapy tend to be in the veins and not the arteries. And a stroke happens when generally when the arteries are affected, um, not the veins. Um, but it's still something we tell people, no, you can't do that if you've had a history of stroke. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the chiropractic thing because you know I have a lot of patients who come in and say, what do you think about chiropractors? And I'm actually okay with some chiropractors, though I always tell people, yeah, I don't want you, you know, please tell your chiropractor not to do any of the big you know, snapping of the neck or anything. Um, some chiropractors do employ much more gentle methods, um, which, which I think is okay. But, um, um, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that, that you do well, have to... My dissection, yeah. my second dissection yeah. was uh, neck snapping. Yeah, exactly. And um, it's, not, it's not a common thing, you know, and I've gone back and forth with some chiropractors about whether the chiropractic manipulation actually was the cause of you know, a person's uh, dissection or not. I always think it is because it yeah, makes sense. It I know, <laughs> I know. Um, so uh, again, I don't, I don't necessarily come down on chiropractors either because I think some do a really good job and a, with a much more gentle approach. Um, but it's worth asking if you're thinking about going that direction. Um, yes, but you do have to be careful about that. Especially those of us who have Funky, uh, exactly. Yeah, funny. and I'm glad you mentioned the yoga thing too, because um, um, you know yoga is very popular, which I think is a great thing. Yoga is wonderful, but yeah, there's some. But they're saying extreme yoga, like exactly. Yoga. Yeah. And then the other, I guess the other one would be some alcohol. What right. about the other ones on our list, watch right. list is uh, things like Red Bull. Okay. And yeah. um, because there's been so, there are a lot of studies mm -hmm. um, about the vascular abnormalities. And I think it's now I think banned in four countries. Okay, I didn't and, realize that. Um, yeah. I think Denmark, Norway, okay. France, maybe Australia. Okay. And so that's something that you know. Yeah. A lot of we have a group of almost thirteen hundred. Uh, under 55-year-old stroke survivors, okay. and people say, is it okay to drink these energy drinks? Right. We say, yeah. Don't do it if you have, you know. Right. I, yeah, and I think that's just a good thing in general. I, I um, tell a lot of my patients, I don't want you drinking energy drinks just because I think there's no particular reason to, but um, yes. Uh, yeah, um, I, I just directly that I do understand, I had a stroke with a supranoid hemorrhage five years ago, and last month I had a TIA. Okay. And I had another TIA before. Now, my blood pressure is fantastic. Right. It's like 126. I don't have a problem with that. 
And when I had the first stroke in the hemorrhage, that's when they found the um, FMUT in my carotid artery. Mm -hmm. Okay. But um, you didn't mention supralacrimal hemorrhage. You, you just said hemorrhage. Is that different? Is a hemorrhage? Is there a, a difference between just a hemorrhage and a um, yes, well, hemorrhage can occur in different parts of the brain. So the subarachnoid tissue um, is what covers the brain, and a subarachnoid hemorrhage means that the blood essentially is between that tissue and the brain. Um, but you can get a hemorrhage that's within the brain tissue itself. Um, you can get people who have hemorrhages uh, that involve both areas, um, and you can get um, some hemorrhages that are outside that tissue layer, so the blood collects and it starts pushing on the brain. The more the blood collects there, and that's what causes the symptoms. So yes, there are different types there. Yeah. Yes? Just a comment on chiropractic. My son is a chiropractor, mm -hmm. and if you come in with certain symptoms, he will treat you different than a normal adjustment. They are trained in how to deal with FMD patients. Great. And also, the, the theory or the thought behind it is that we do have compromised vessels and veins that the blood flow is not as well maybe in someone else. But actually, the adjustment keeps those, I have it in vertebrals, keeps the um, vertebrae. Mm, I see. Yeah. In sync and in line, where it actually will increase your blood flow to your brain. Okay. And so I think there's a real controversy that's not openly being discussed between the traditional medical stream and alternative treatment. Mm -hmm. And so I just think that we need to be careful on what we're saying about one medical profession versus another medical profession. And there's been this actually has been researched on how many chiropractic strokes have been caused. Mm -hmm. and there's a possibility that that was in the process of happening and basically the chiropractic moved it on. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to be real careful when we pit one medical profession against another. And also I think it depends on the training of the chiropractor in your discussion with your chiropractor is the same as your medical profession because the medical field is making prescriptions and signing a medicine to people that is causing damage to the bodies. So I think what we need to do is be open in our discussion. It's just like Sarah's talking about awareness. Your son is probably much more aware right. than you're wanting to be Same with MD. Some MDs yeah. are there. The more aware they are, the more they are likely to make allowances. Well, and Dr. Ingebrecht is exactly right in that some can do so much more of a gentle manipulation versus that, you know, you hear people talking about, you want to get your back cracked. And it's this, yeah, horribly violent, mm -hmm. crunchy kind of thing. Um, I have gone for my lower back, but I to say, I don't want you to do any of this because it concerns me. Um, and so if you think, yeah, having communication and talking about it, but yeah, that vigorous snapping thing with the neck just creeps me out. You know, you know, it, just, it, just, it doesn't sound like a good idea anyway. You know, I mean, look at the And my chiropractor, <laughs> even I was going in for a lower back, but part of his standard procedure mm -hmm. was he always did yeah. neck alignment. And we didn't know that I had vascular problems. Yeah. And I did that for so many years. And I had I love going there and uh, my doctor that I never went back to him. Actually I believe in do massage because of, uh, because of my RA also. It, it makes everything that swells up move the blood stream faster. Mm -hmm. And I get worse. Okay, interesting. Yes, sir. 
kind of uh, same sort of being, I suppose. Uh, patients, painted patient assertiveness. I guess is uh, if and the patient is in an emergency, has stroke symptoms to the point they're in an emergency room or a hospital, and uh, I suppose in the emergency room they're being seen by emergency physicians, and in hospitals these days they're being seen by hospitalists. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and looking at your statistics, FND patients are significantly more likely to have a stroke in the peers than regular than the middle person. Mm -hmm. um, how does what, what should a patient do when they're dissatisfied? You know, it's the hospitalist that's seeing them, mm -hmm. and, and and the hospital perhaps isn't going to bring in uh, your specialty. Mm -hmm. um, what's the what what should a patient do? Should a patient demand? Uh, that uh, they want to see someone that, in your specialty, or should we just be content with the hospitalist opinion? Yeah. So um, I, I think it's I think it's okay to demand. You know, if, if if you're presenting with stroke symptoms in a hospital that has neurologists on staff, um, is that a likely thing? An unlikely thing? I don't know. Yeah. So. Um, it depends on where you are, um, because I know there are a number of hospitals in the general area that do not have any neurologists on staff. And so, you know, if a neurologist is on staff, you're almost you're pretty much guaranteed to be seeing a neurologist if you're presenting with stroke symptoms. Um, many um, many hospitals have a protocol in place already um, called a code stroke or some other such name. Um, where somebody comes in with stroke-like symptoms and these are the things that get done and a neurologist is usually part of that. Um, but situations do arise where um, um, you're at a hospital and a neurologist is not available. And, um, and, and then I think it's okay for a patient to, to be assertive. Um, what or, will a hospital do? Will they actually go out and, and bring in a neurologist? Um, um, one of two things, they, they might just call for a, a consultation over the phone and um, some of the things that uh, some of the local area, uh, local hospitals are now doing is um, this kind of um, consultation by, by video or, you know, remote consultation. And so a neurologist can actually look at the, you know, MRI scan or the CT scan or, or the like, um, sometimes potentially even, you know, look at the patient themselves um, and, try to dictate care, um, especially if they're a candidate for one of those early intervention treatments, um, understanding that the patient probably will be transferred to a, you know, to Mission Hospital or, you know, to a, a, a center with a neurologist on staff. Um, so they might, um, so the emergency room might, you know, call a neurologist to get their opinion. Um, they might arrange for a transfer. Um, uh, that's also very reasonable. I know I know it's hard um, from a patient perspective um, to be demanding or be assertive because then it's very easy to, you know, run the risk of being labeled as the difficult patient. You know, the squeaky wheel um, gets the oil, and and you know that that sticks with you. The doctor's talking to another doctor and said, "Well, this patient complained, and it's kind of a pain, and so, but will you take him?" Um, I, I still think it's okay to be your own advocate. You know, in some of these situations. Something mm -hmm. I uh, with the team, I have um, um, all my doctors are EMRI system. So I have uh, did some research, and uh, the closest hospital to my home that I could get the fastest was uh, St. Joe's, which is about 30 minutes away. On August when I was in the ambulance going, um, the person in the ambulance, I forgot how it's called. So she said that she was going to take me to a Keystone hospital. I said, no, I'm not going there. She said, but you're going to die. I said, I'll die, but I'll die at St. Joseph's, which is the mm -hmm. But I'm not going to get there because I knew they didn't have a neurologist for this guy. And I knew they didn't have a stroke procedure. So as soon as I got to San uh, Joseph's, although the emergency doctor had no idea what FMD was, mm -hmm. they had a procedure that they would uh, follow, take, uh, taking blood pressure, and my blood pressure was uh, 
almost 200 in the implements. So, and then they admit you, and then they get to the neurologist. So I think it, the best thing for us that have a problem with the, the GIAs or strokes, uh, it's just look in our area and then see who has the best stuff and just go there. Well, one of the places you can do that is on National Stroke Association website, stroke.org. There's a list there that says emergency stroke centers, and so you are able to put in your zip code, and it's probably good. It's something you would want to know before, you know, is to know where, because they could be um, Joint Commission accredited and stroke network mm -hmm. um, facilities. Right. And I have a, even a card that I carry with me that uh, tells where I want to be taken, you know. Uh, and uh, I uh, won't go to other places other than the ones. If I can't speak when I have a TIV, sometimes you can't, mm -hmm. then, but I have that card. So this last time I was able to speak. Yeah. But uh, when I'm not having a TIV or something, I have this little card that says what I have and uh, where I want to be. Taken. Mm. And, and one comment about that, you know, again, I think it is okay to do that, to, to request where you want to go. Sometimes the first responders are under certain constraints, especially if there's a potential emergency situation like a stroke or a heart attack where um, they have to take you to the closest place. Um, and, and it is, you know, somewhat of a legal thing because what if you die on the way to the other one and you don't have a card and, and, and then they're, they're stuck. That's they're, what she yeah. said. Yeah. She, she said, I have to tell you something, mm -hmm. you know, and you have to make a choice, but I have to have this on right. record. And she said, uh, you know, this hospital is 10 minutes away. Mm -hmm. The other one is 30 minutes away. Mm -hmm. And you will die. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't just have this responsibility. So you do say on record, uh, well, like I did, I told her, okay, I'll die at St. Joseph's, mm -hmm. but I won't go to this one. Mm -hmm. Because it's a bad hospital. Yeah. No matter what, you know, right. do, yeah. they're for anything. But uh, yeah, they do inform you about mm -hmm. that, and then you do make that decisions all recorded. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. I was curious. <clears throat> What would you tell a patient, either an FMD patient or a regular patient of yours, that possibly also suffers from migraine and gets the stroke symptoms that mm -hmm. you discussed um, regularly with their migraines? Mm -hmm. When would you advise them to say, okay, this is this is now is when I should go to the hospital right. versus, okay, right. this is probably a migraine, if right. they're getting those symptoms constantly with their migraines? Right. When do you stop them? So um, it's a good question. Uh, sometimes it's tricky, but um, if if the symptoms, the stroke-like symptoms, are going on for more than an hour, because usually with a migraine it's going to be less than an hour, um, but it's, if it's longer lasting than normal, then that's definitely a go to the hospital thing. Um, if you know, again, most patients with these auras, with these migraine auras, know what their auras are because they've happened a number of times and they've happened in the same way each time. If there's something out of the ordinary, you know, a new symptom or um, more severe symptom than they're used to, that would be another reason to seek attention. Um, it's hard because auras can change. I see this in a lot of my patients that they don't always have the same aura each time. Not every headache comes with an aura um, or sometimes as they get older, they start to have different auras where they may have had vision changes before, now they're getting numbness or weakness. And, you know, each time there's a change like that, we do have to treat it as if it's the most potentially dangerous thing, which is a TIA. And so, um, so again, if there is a change, that's a reason to go to the hospital. And, and you know, it's one of those situations if everything turns out being okay, um, uh, and the testing all looks normal and everything, you know, so be it. That's that's okay. At least you were in a safe place for that. Um, but it is a challenge. Um, it's very much a challenge. Um, yes, again. Could you address um, the vascular part of what happens with the string of beads? Uh -huh. um, is that actually 
does the vessel actually do that clump, 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 or is that just like when someone's having the MRA, how the blood is flowing through there? What makes up those little yeah. curlicues? And then does that is that more of a risk for a stroke? Right. Plotting or other right. things from right. that little right. crunchy, crunchy part. Um, so as far as I understand, and one disclaimer, I'm not an expert on FMD, but because of the because of the irregularities the um, in the blood vessel wall, um, the different parts of the blood vessel wall can be thicker than um, um, than usual. That's actually what leads to the string of beads. So there's areas that um, appear more narrow on the MRA because the blood vessel wall is thicker than it should be. But so and that, the outside, would it look smooth and that's the inside? Um, looks from the outside, yes, it could look smooth. It could just still look like a tube, but on the inside it's got that irregularity. Um, but um, I don't know the answer to the question of that particular disease segment of blood vessel is more likely to um, lead to clot formation. Um, potentially, yes, because if it's irregular, again, there's more turbulent flow. Um, uh, again, picture a, picture a stream going through rapids. Um, a lot of the water gets through the rapids, but there are some places where there can be kind of eddies where water gets hung up. And if blood does that too, it tends to clot. If blood slows down, it clots. And so potentially, yes, I could see if it's causing irregular flow through that area, you could get those pockets where there might be more um, slow blood flow and then and thus clotting. Um, but that's more that's more a you know a hypothesis because I don't know the answer to that. I also don't know the answer to whether that particular segment of the blood vessel is more likely to dissect. Um, I think it probably is because um, because the carotids and the vertebrals are a lot of a lot of times where the irregularities are found, and those are usually the areas where people have the dissections. Um, because I didn't know whether they had looked at all as to whether with the new stents, right. whether those like the new pipeline stents right. would open up that yeah. area and smooth yeah. it down, or whether it's so risky that yeah. you wouldn't stick a stent in there. Right. I mean, that's a very valid idea because, um, um, I, you know, as far as I know, stenting is still a viable therapy. If somebody with FMD has a dissection, stenting, putting a little tube in that narrowed area to keep the blood vessel open, is a is a treatment option. Um, so if if that's the case, if they can do it in the setting of a dissection, I imagine that it would be safe to do it even in just a diseased vessel that hasn't had a problem yet. But I don't know. I don't know that for certain. Yes. Um, within our community as a whole, the headaches mm -hmm. are very common, mm -hmm. and this general. Pain, just, mm -hmm. you know, being referred to as myalgia, or whatever. Right. Um, but also given our demographic, way too often we're hearing about patients either going to their doctors or going to the hospital having symptoms and being dismissed mm -hmm. as histrionic. Mm -hmm. And it's all in our head, we're imagining it, or we're drug seeking, or anything like that. And so, how with these sort of vague symptoms that are largely based on you know, self reporting, mm -hmm. I have a headache, you can't confirm right. that I have a headache, right. how do you recommend that patients talk to either their doctors that they see regularly or doctors in an emergency setting? to get the point across that you know, we're not just a bunch of right. women right. and that, right. you know, and, and so often we tend to just, I mean, based on necessity, we tend to know more about the disease right. than many of the treaties. Right. And so how do we get that across and successfully mm -hmm. <laughs> So um, one thing that I always think is helpful is being very detailed in your description of what's going on. Um, somebody who comes into me and says, well, I hurt all over, what does it feel like? I don't know, I just hurt. Um, first of all, it's very hard to do an assessment of a person like that um, because the range of things that could cause that is so huge. Um, but also, um, I, I don't necessarily 
uh, now that I jump to, hey, this person is drug seeking, but um, I also don't feel very confident that I'm going to be able to arrive at anything that can help them or, or even set off on a path to try to figure out what's going on. So, so I do ask people, you know, try to be specific about what you're experiencing, you know, where you're having the pain. Every doctor, this is the first thing we learn in medical school about taking a history, it's pain and where it is, what does it feel like, you know, how often is it there, what makes it better, what makes it worse. You know, thinking about things like that beforehand I think can be very helpful. Um, and, um, you know, I hate to say it, but if somebody comes in and they're kind of organized like that, I probably am going to sit up and pay attention a little bit more than somebody who's um, all over the map. Um, some Can you repeat that list? <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, so, you know, where, where's the pain? Location? Um, quality of pain? What does it feel like? Um, patterns? Um, anything that um, makes it better or worse? Um, duration? Um, frequency? Those are... Those are, you know, a lot of common questions that that I'll ask, um, and you know, it's, it's hard because some people come in and they're not very organized in their thinking because that's the way they are, you know, and um, and and uh, so I don't want to imply that I tune everybody out like that, but um, but it becomes a lot harder. Um, and you had another question that I had an answer to. No, I can't remember. <laughs> um, the way that um, the way that you should kind of present yeah, it. Yeah, just communicate um, with doctors. And yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, something I also find really helpful is uh, when somebody tells me how it affects them in their daily life. Um, because it's one thing to say you have a headache. It's another to say, um, and when I have a headache, I find that playing with my kids is really difficult. Or um, sitting at a computer drives me nuts, and I, I have trouble concentrating on my work because because I'm doing that. Um, because again, you know, to me, um, not only is that useful information for understanding how severe the pain is, um, but that you know that makes it a lot more unique to the specific person, and and really makes me understand. Okay, this is this is what's going on, and and these are these are the goals for this patient is to be able to play with their kids, you know, without having to worry about pain, be able to go to work and focus and do a good job without having to, you know, um, take a couple hours to take a nap, you know, or leave work early. So, um, so that's always something that I think can be very important. Yeah. I'm just curious, how many of your patients actually write this down? Yeah, um, yeah, so um, not many. I'm, I'm smiling because um, another kind of red flag, oh my gosh, sign is when somebody comes in and they have, they hand me a, a five-page printout, <laughs> you know, um, uh, um, one of my, one of my mentors used to communicate with some patients via email, but he also used to tell them, I don't read more than three lines, you know, you have to, you have to be concise about it, so, so I don't have a lot of patients who come in with, with, um, the list already written out, it does, again, make a difference to me as whether they've narrowed it down or if they're saying, and five years ago I remember that my big toe was tingly for three seconds, you know, because that's that's where, it, you know, then there's too much information and, again, it's just everything's lost in a cloud of symptoms and I can't really help them. Um, um, I guess that would be another thing is, you know, kind of try to be to be focused on what the issue is right now that's bringing you in, especially for an emergency room visit. Obviously, there's a reason you went to the emergency room. Um, but um, even though you may be seeing a doctor for the first time for multiple different symptoms, as I remember the first time I saw you, um, uh, it's you know addressing each symptom at a time and trying to be organized about it that, that I find very helpful. Um, yes? Um. This is a question from one of our uh, friends online. She's asking um, if you could mention about exercise or activities to avoid with the um, carotid ability. Yeah, um, you know, I think I think like you were mentioning earlier, um, anything that involves kind of extreme positions in the neck, and so that could apply to things like um, yoga. Um, 
There aren't there aren't many things that I restrict people on. I mean, simple you know running, swimming, um, biking. None of those are going to put enough strain on the vessels that it's going to put you at a high risk for any kind of um, uh, dissection, bleed, or anything like that. Um, Yes, I'm sorry. Do you have a comment about say, that? My uh, yeah. neurosurgeon, mm -hmm. not on regular exercise, but his like absolute no list is um, roller coasters, mm -hmm. uh, bungee jumping, skydiving. Right. <laughs> right. Any of those. <laughs> right. Do anything. Right. Anything <laughs> like that does, but even roller yeah. coasters. You know. They, yeah. He does not like that. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, and and I would agree with that. Everything that's going to be because the sky diving before I got yeah. the stroke. Yeah. Yeah. My doctor said, and then I said I'm going to go back because I was taken as a hobby. Right. And he said, No, you are not. Yeah. Yeah. You know, right. The um, sky diving is out. Right. But I swim. Right. Uh, in the summer, all right. summer, every day. You know, right. Back and forth. Back and forth. Right. Yeah. So I mean a good rule for exercises for any other thing in life is everything in moderation, whether you know what you're doing, um, the extremes of anything can sometimes cause problems. So protect the neck. Protect the neck. <laughs> yes. Does the smoking continue to be a risk factor even if you quit? It has. So it becomes it becomes less and less of a risk factor the longer you go on. Um, there was another interesting study that I read just a few months ago that showed that um, essentially people can smoke up to the age of I think 25 or 27, and if they quit at that point, they don't seem to have any residual risk factors going ahead. Which I kind of wish I knew when I was in college because that would have made me worry about a lot less. But um, the um, it still remains a risk factor, you know. Tobacco does damage to the blood vessels, and that damage stays there. But a remote history is much less of a concern than somebody who's still smoking two packs a day. Yeah. I sometimes feel that those of us with MND have a concept that our veins and vessels are fragile. Mm -hmm. I don't know anything about the structure of the normal vein and arteries, are they a weak or strong uh, part of organ or what do you mean? Yeah, so um, specifically for FMD, I think if I tried to answer that, I'd be lying to you because I'm just, I'm just not an expert to, yeah. Um, it's it's um, true in many parts of the body. If there's some kind of miss or malformation of any body part, it tends not to be as structurally sound. Um, when I mentioned that that vascular malformation that earlier that can bleed, you know, the blood vessels are all still connecting the way they should. There's still blood flowing through there, but um, they're not as strong. They're not, they're more likely to bleed. Um, so even in a situation like FMD where the blood vessel wall is thicker than it should be, um, that doesn't always mean that it's stronger. Um, but I don't know, I don't honestly know if um, kind of dynamic comparisons have been made between normal blood vessel tissue and FMD tissue um, to see if there is any kind of inherent weakness. Um, I, I figure there must be some because that's why they, the vessels tear, that's why they dissect, that's why they bleed. Let's wrap up questions. And we'll take a short break and soon make sure to your audience. Is there anybody having any comments, questions, mm -hmm. comments? Excellent yeah. presentation. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, good. Okay, we'll take about a five, seven minute break. Refill your coffee, run to the bathroom, etc. <laughs>
So the next topics that we're actually going to be covering is dealing with long-term disease. And I'll let you introduce more about the program and come on up. Introduce yourself. It's always easier to introduce myself than to have somebody else introduce me. So it's, <laughs> it's great to be here. I have the opportunity to talk, share, discuss one of my favorite topics, which is the perfect complement to clinical care, which you've just been hearing about. Sounds like that was a really awesome presentation and that the doctor provided some really great information. This presentation is more about the, the art of self-management. Most of the time, living with a chronic health condition like FMD is not spent in the doctor's office, right? It's spent living life. So this presentation specifically is about breaking the symptom cycle. So those places where symptoms show up, how to self-manage those opportunities for um, really living a healthy life with FMD. And so my background, I'm actually a gerontologist, which is the study of aging and health promotion specialist. And I'm involved in this program called the Chronic Disease Self-Management Program, which is kind of the gold standard of evidence-based health promotion programs. And I just love, and obviously you, I'm preaching to the choir because you are the ones. I love the belief that we can get healthier as we age. We can stay healthy and live a healthy life with a chronic health condition. It, it requires something of us. It requires self-management and self-awareness, but it's certainly a possibility. And so that's what I take a stand for, and that's what I get to share with you about today. So in order to put this presentation into context, just want to look a little bit at the distinctions between a chronic and an acute sort of health condition. And I'm sure both come up with FMD. I'm not an expert in FMD, so you'll be teaching me as well. But um, you know that, that both come up and they require different types of self-management. So like an example of acute, an acute condition would be, what would be an example of an acute condition? Mm -hmm. Flu, not usually very cute, but yeah. That's an acute condition, exactly. Cold. What's that? Heart attack. Mm -hmm. Stroke. Right? Stroke. Mm -hmm. um, broken leg, even. Accident can be cause of an acute condition. Versus a chronic condition like FMD, or what are some other examples? RA. RA. Fibromyalgia. Uh -huh. Fibromyalgia. Lupus. Cancer. Right. These things are now considered to be chronic health conditions, things that we live with. And so, the way an acute condition usually begins, it's quick. Like you wake up in the morning and you have the condition or you have an accident, the condition's there. With a chronic condition like those that we've mentioned in FMD, you may not even know when it started. The beginning is slow, it's not clear, it, it varies over time. Is that accurate for you with FMD? Yeah. The cause, with an acute condition, it's usually just one. It's usually a virus or an accident or a bacteria. With a chronic condition, there's generally many causes, or sometimes the causes are unknown. So knowing the cause doesn't necessarily help you to manage the condition. The duration, of course, we know that with an acute condition, the duration is short, usually two weeks, 10 days. But with a chronic condition, the duration, the cure is rare. So the duration is usually over a lifetime, obviously. The diagnosis, it's usually pretty clear with an acute condition. Was it clear to get your uh, diagnosis for FMD? Does anyone have a clear time with that? No, it's not clear. And it's not, it's not an easy journey. And, and um, usually it's more about ruling things out than it is about figuring out what exactly one has. The test. The test can be really an important with an acute condition because you can cure it. A lot of tests with a chronic condition can sometimes be of less value or less use because it's testing over and over again, which can cause worry and um, just really ruling things out, as we mentioned. With an acute condition, the treatment is usually, you know, one thing. Usually, there's an, a treat. There is a treatment, and it works. And with a chronic condition, as we said before, the cure is rare. There's really about managing the symptoms and managing all the the secondary factors that come up. But what's really important about all this is our healthcare system and the role of the professional and the role of the patient. So, with an acute condition, what's the role of your doctor or healthcare professional? An acute condition like the flu. 
Yeah, yeah, usually like, you know, if it's surgery, yep, prescribing something or performing something. What's the role of the professional with a chronic health condition? Monitoring. Yeah, monitoring. I would even go to say teaching and advising, guiding. And what about with the role of the, the patient with an acute condition? It's usually to follow orders. Do what the doctor says. It's not a good time to argue usually if you have a broken leg or, you know, it's an acute condition. With a chronic health condition, it's really a different story. The role of the patient becomes much more active. It's really about a partnership with the healthcare provider. The healthcare provider isn't going to cure it, so it's up to us to monitor in a way. It's up to us to indicate our preferences for treatment and to, to track how we're feeling so that we can report on it. So it's really a different scenario. And much of our healthcare system is designed for the acute model, and it's having a little bit of a hard time adjusting to the high level of chronic diseases that we have. So really, the information that I'm going to share with you today is something that many have found helpful to help to break the symptom cycle and to manage living with a chronic health condition. And I think life is a chronic health condition, to be honest. I mean, we're all managing every day. So it, it's really our choice whether we want to be active managers or passive managers. And no matter how active you are right now, you can become more activated in your self-management and self-care. So that's really what I would love to share with you a little more about today. Some of this might be reminders. Some of it might elicit some of your intrinsic knowing already. It's less me giving information and more reminding us about self-management. And you might learn some new things. Um, let's see. I'm going to just flip to a blank page here. In this kind of model or program, we like to look at the problems that arise, but only long enough to look for solutions because we can't really necessarily get to the solution without identifying a problem. So what are some of the problems that come up for you? They could be physical, emotional. Does everyone here live with FMD or some caregivers? I love one. Love one. Friend. Friend. Okay. Mm -hmm. caregiver. E caregiver. Even being a loved one or a friend of someone with FMD increase increases your own risk of chronic health conditions. We know that being a caregiver increases your risk of having a chronic health condition. So it's just as important as a caregiver to acknowledge the problems that arise and attend to those for you as it is for the person with FMD because you want to be healthy and well to support your loved one. So what are some of the problems that arise either from living with FMD or having a loved one with FMD for you? Physical, emotional, anything? Fear. What's that? Fear. Fear. Yeah. And you mentioned fatigue. Mm -hmm. Just the uncertainty. Just because today's good doesn't mean anything about tomorrow. Yeah, the uncertainty. Guilt. What's that? Guilt? Which I think is the ways that then it's something that we've talked about with me as patients and as caregiver that I feel guilty for not being able to do things or help more and then there can be some feeling of resentment that gets built in and you'll feel guilty for not being able to fix me and yeah. then you might resent me because I can't help as much and so then you feel guilty like for resenting me and say so that it's just sort of the same but the spiral, kind of the cycle. And we're going to talk a little bit about that cycle because that's really, you know, the, the guilt, the fear, the uncertainty, these emotional sort of qualities, the fatigue. They're symptoms just like any other symptom, just like pain. They're symptom of having, you know, either living with or having a loved one with a chronic health condition. What else comes up as a problem? What was that? Depression? Yeah. Anything else? The worry. Yeah. Of financial worry. Or, financial worry is one of those. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you worry about a lot of things, and, and then there's always the underlying financial thing of will the insurance be canceled or you know, those kinds of things. Wow, I'm surprised you didn't get any of the physical except for fatigue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Relationships. Yeah, relationships. Problems with relationships. 
Absolutely. Pain. All the time. You know, interesting that pain is there all the time, but it came up, you know, like eighth on the list out of really what's important about the whole being. Yeah. The other ones? Not being eight, I mean, it's not a single word. It's okay. But not being able to do what you need to be able to. Yeah. Like, I miss being able to shovel a few yards more. <laughs> I don't want to be able to carry the cubic yard much anymore, so that kind of helps prevent that situation. And you know, being a gerontologist, that's one of the biggest things as people get older, not being able to do the things that they were once able to do is one of the hardest things to deal with. And what I see as an indicator of, I won't say successful aging, but aging with vitality, optimal aging, is being able to be um, flexible, being able to change how we do things. And so, you know, these are some of the very real problems that arise. Fear, fatigue, uncertainty, guilt, both ways, depression, worry, including financial, relationships, pain, not being able to do what you used to be able to do. They undergo incredible medical procedures. Yeah. Okay. The, the tests are very invasive. Invasive tests. Does that feel right, well, or is that just the tests? It's uh, invasive treatments, surgeries, and treatments, and, and tests. The whole when something happens that requires, it can require incredibly invasive treatments and procedures, life-threatening situations. Yeah, when Sarah gets sick, she gets sick. <laughs> Usually, has to get gutted like a fish. Yeah, it's hardcore. <laughs> Not getting around. That's tr that's true. Thank you for saying that. So in some ways, I think probably people with FMD would be some of the best teachers of how to be resilient and how to be able to adjust. I know that when I met Sarah, that's one of the things that really impressed me as she was sharing her story. All that she's been through, yet she still had this buoyant sort of energy. And, you know, interestingly, when I do this class on chronic disease self-management, I train leaders and I lead classes and coordinate it, these things come up for m almost all chronic health conditions. Not so much the invasive treatment and test part, but almost all these things. There's a commonality about living life with a chronic health condition that is not really addressed by our healthcare system, but it's something that we have to take care of, we have to manage. And so as I mentioned before, we're all managing, right? Whether we get up in the morning and we don't do anything about it, you know, just pretend it's not happening, we're managing, that's a passive management. Or we can wake up and we can say, you know, what am I focusing on today? How am I going to take charge of my well-being, including all those emotional qualities that we talked about? If we choose to be an active self-manager, there's these tasks which are important. And I'll read them because I know it's hard to see. But the first is keeping informed about your status and asking questions. We're the best experts on ourselves. We spend our lives living with ourselves. So it's really our job to stay informed about how we're doing, you know, maintaining records, and asking questions, which it sounds like you're all great at. That's why you're here. Um, taking part in planning your treatment, communicating your preferences. Sometimes you may not have a choice, but sometimes we do. So it's really our job as self-managers to be that partnership with our healthcare provider and communicate what it is that we prefer. Informing the healthcare team about problems and changes. Does anyone here have more than one doctor? Oh my God. <laughs> and I know they communicate really well amongst each other, but there's times when it might be required for us to take information from healthcare provider to healthcare provider. And that includes dentists too. So really just being that person that, and I'm sure you've all developed systems and strategies to do that. And if not, that's certainly a self-management tool that you can use. Trying new things and giving them at least a two-week trial. So, you know, um, I'm sure that you know through being resilient that sometimes you have to, wow, this thing that I've been doing isn't working, or maybe I need to try something new for my health and well-being. So being a self-manager, an active self-manager, really requires doing things differently because doing things the same way just tend to get the same results. And sometimes those results are good, but sometimes we want different results. Setting goals and working towards them kind of given ourselves a trajectory for greater health, even if it means that we still have that you still have FMD, giving yourself goals of what you want for your well-being. Does anyone here set goals? 
Do we have any goal setters in the house? A couple people. A little bit. And sometimes goals are too big to take all on at once, so it just seems overwhelming. It's just about getting through the day. But even if it's that small sort of goal, like how you're going to get through this day, when we set our sight on something positive, it kind of pulls us there. And then the symptom management techniques. And that's really what I want to talk a little bit about today. You mentioned the pain and the fatigue as some symptoms. Any other symptoms that you experienced? The depression? Well, my uh, physical is... Uh, some days I'm not able to just get up. I have to wait yeah. until I can move because of the RA and then the neck pain and the headache. So I just have to make up. Yeah, so like joint I, pain and... Mm -hmm. But I think that a positive attitude, you know, helps a lot. Yeah. And I do that every day. I mean, I don't... I set goals every day. Yeah, you it's know, the little like goals. I'm going to make them. I don't know, a dress, or I'm going to do something in the house, or, you know. So it's That's great. Wow. So some of you should be leaders of the chronic disease self-management program. That's one of the cool things about this program is that it's led by people with chronic conditions for people with chronic conditions. <laughs> I've been a leader for about 10 years since I lived in Canada. It's an international program. Um, and I was inspired to see people getting healthier and healthier and telling these sorts of stories. So, you know, these are all over the United States. Um, I know you live in different places. And you may be interested in getting involved in either as a leader, which kind of offers your sh to share your wisdom with other people and experience. This is a really cool way of reinterpreting symptoms. And this is one of the key pieces of the program. So most people believe that the symptom, let's say tense muscles, are caused by the disease. Let's say arthritis, for example. Or let's say, no, let's say pain. So let's say we believe that arthritis causes pain, and there's just like this. And there's not much we can do about that except for take a medication to relieve the pain. And it's true, arthritis causes pain. When bone rubs against bone or there's an inflamed joint, there's pain there. However, what tends to happen when we have any sort of pain or affected area, we tense our muscles to protect it. It's just a natural physiological response. So now, not only do we have pain, we have pain and tense muscles. And when we tense the muscles, the blood flow can't get to the area as effectively, which can then increase the pain. All of these things kind of create a pattern of stress or anxiety in the body. So now we've got the pain and tense muscles, more pain, stress, and anxiety. And when we're tensing our muscles, folks tend to hold their breath. I know I do. And so then the shortness of breath, you know, creates not as much oxygen getting to the areas, which can lead to fatigue. And you know, you can see how this cycle, it's not as simple as the disease causing the symptom. Yeah. Well, with the fatigue though, for those of us that have had a brain injury, yeah, and it really has nothing to do with the muscles or the mm -hmm. shortness. I mean, it's just kind of a side effect of the disease uh, of yeah, brain, brain injury, injury. And, and that's one of the hardest things because it, mm -hmm. it's not normal it, even your doctors start saying you know are you really that you know yeah it's hard for them to understand that feeling of somebody's pulled your stuffing out right yeah I hear you so it's it's not true that it's always a cycle certainly the disease can cause the symptom on its own but like fatigue but what I invite you to look at are any other things that might come into play that make the fatigue worse. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Like the stress. Everybody yeah. realizes that the stress makes the fatigue, fatigue worse. worse. Yeah. And then the shortness of breath sometimes just, you know, even paying attention to taking deep breaths. But you're right. There is no doubt about it. The disease causes a symptom. But the, the value of looking at it differently is that there's opportunities to break the cycle when we look at it differently. And it may not always be true, but it's one way of looking at it. And the difficult emotions and the depression can all make all symptoms seem worse. So there's, there's things that we can do to break that symptom cycle, and we kind of categorize those into things that you can do with your mind and things that you can do with your body. Any ideas about things you can do with your mind? We talked about a little bit with the positive thinking to break this symptom cycle. Therapy, just talking out your problems. Meditation, prayer. What was that? Fear. Fear. I don't. Is that mental or is that physical? I'm not sure. It kind of crosses the line. But you can see how you know meditation, prayer, or beer would break the cycle about fear. 
tense muscles and pain or stress and anxiety. Was that reading? Yeah. Distraction is a great technique. Mm -hmm. Pets. Yeah. Pets are a great distraction. I use gardening. Basic mindfulness. Yeah, just really tuning into what is actually happening in this moment. Mindfulness practice. Exercise. Exercise, yep. Oh, I hate that. <laughs> I thought you said you liked it. I heard you asking questions oh, all about swimming. exercise. I only like okay. swimming. <laughs> swimming and skydiving. Yes. Oh, my God. Right? <laughs> but I just, I think what helps me yeah. is uh, to get over this because, uh, you know, I am deformed, inside to deform now, and uh, yeah. it is painful. Yeah. But the way to distract me off all that, I just uh, do other things. Like, uh, I, was, I work with uh, volunteers as a volunteer for animal rescue group and uh, take care of uh, animals and things like that, mm -hmm. especially the ones that are sick. Mm -hmm. So I put my focus on something else. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then I don't think so much about those things. Mm -hmm. and, uh, to me, it's natural. Yeah. So with being playing every day, it's something that I learned to live with. Right. So, yeah, exactly. You know, and uh, I, I think if you just focus on something else and not so much on the fatigue, on the shortness of breath, mm -hmm. and all that stuff, you do better. That's right. I agree. You know, yeah. and if you pace yourself. Yeah, yeah. Those are all great techniques, and I think we can all either learn from some of those or share in those. Yeah. One of the things we haven't mentioned is playing an instrument. Uh -huh. If you're lucky enough to be a musician or involved with that, because it kind of takes in all of those things. It's the meditation, mm -hmm. it's the presence, it's pain. Uh, really, I mean, there's a lot of things that... Breathing usually breathe, comes yeah. into that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, can help with depression, fatigue. Yeah, playing instruments. Those are all great examples of self-management techniques. And so part of the beauty of this type of model of program is that you get a group of people together and they... Sh they share with one another in a facilitated way what works, and so people have new ideas like, oh, you know, maybe I should consider that. Those are awesome ideas. So one of the things that we mentioned was exercise. Before I flip that page, I'd like to ask you, what do you think are some of the benefits of exercise? I heard that little dialogue about exercise that you were having with the doctor, and so he said most exercise is good exercise, moderate is good. What, what are some of the benefits that you know to exercise? Yeah. Mine uh, reduces the, uh, okay, never mind. <laughs> It'll come back. It'll come back. It can be a social activity as well. Yeah. Getting that. Yeah, it can be a way to be with other people. Uh huh. I love to run or walk oh, with friends. Oh, yeah, help me uh, get rid of the stiffness. Stiffness. It can help yes. to release stiffness. Absolutely. Increase yes. flexibility, um, yeah. I have a sense of accomplishment. Exercise. Yeah, like you feel like you're getting better, like you achieved something. Uh -huh. I set goals, and then when I, I, I like to bike. Uh huh. So if I go one mile or two miles or seven miles, I, I set those goals, and that just gives me a sense of accomplishment. Yeah, can increase self esteem by giving us a sense of accomplishment. Any other things that exercise does for you? Well, so I've started exercising regularly. Yeah. And that's the key. I used to not do anything, and then I would go out and go on a long hike or garden real hard or something. And the next day I would be so sore, I couldn't move. Yeah. And so doing it regularly it makes all the difference because it's more pleasurable. You're not, not so worn out from it. You're not so sore and sick. But the measurable benefits have, have been that my blood pressure and blood sugar have both gone down. Wow. So, yeah, it, it's for real. <laughs> it's not kidding. Prescription Rx exercise. Yeah. Well, I guess it uh, increases endorphins, uh -huh. which helps you feel better, and then it also control, helps uh, control blood sugar. Right. Because they talk about uh, diabetics needing less insulin if they uh, exercise. Exercise reduces blood sugar. Yep, exactly. And that, you know, body and mind connection. We know that our mind affects our body. 
and our body affects the mind. So we can really create a good loop when we start to increase the endorphins, which make us feel better, which can actually affect the tissue of the body. So there's a lot of great things with exercise. Just to add to some of the, what you mentioned, which is beyond this list, really, is you know strengthens our cardiovascular system, ability to breathe better and have our blood flows more strong. It strengthens, just gets us stronger. And we can always get stronger no matter where we're at. I was recently at a presentation on fall prevention. That's a big thing I work on, too. I'm not preventing fall, the season of autumn. <laughs> can't do anything about it. It's that kind of nice. But preventing you know, falls, because falls are a real issue as we age. And um, one of the things they talk about is it doesn't matter how old you are. Everybody can increase leg strength, balance. Um, so I, I love knowing that no matter where we're at, we can always increase strength. The more we do, the more we can do. So our endurance and stamina increases the more that we do. Um, flexibility or reduces stiffness. It can reduce our percentage of body fat or bring us to a good balanced weight. It can help us sleep better. And that makes a big difference for me. And in a moderate way, like you mentioned, regular moderate exercise can really increase energy and reduce fatigue. It can reduce pain, reduce depression, as you mentioned and even constipation, which is not one that people like to say, but it really does affect quality of life, that reducing of constipation, and, and it can affect that symptom cycle. So those are some of the physical aspects of what can happen um, you know, with physical activity as a means to breaking the symptom cycle. Next, I want to talk just a little bit about the mental aspects. You mentioned distraction. That's a huge one. I mean, and we even brainstormed some distraction techniques in here. But getting our mind off of the symptoms is a really great technique, especially for short periods of time. Sometimes if we get distracted for a long period of time, we can end up exacerbating the symptom later because um, we can really lose ourselves in the activity. That's not always true, but it can be true for some people. So in order to go more deeply into the effect of the mind on the body, I'd like to welcome you to do a short exercise. If you feel comfortable putting your feet on the floor and closing your eyes for a minute, that'd be great. I won't pull anything scary or just take a nice deep breath here and imagine that you're holding a big bright yellow lemon. Picture it in your mind. You can feel the texture of the lemon rind in your hand. Now lift the lemon to your nose. You can smell its strong citrus aroma. Now bring the lemon to your mouth and take a big bite out of the lemon. It's juicy. The juice squirts all through your mouth. You can taste that tart lemon juice filling your mouth. The juice dribbles down your chin. Suck the juice from that lemon. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. So what happened to your body while you were imagining the lemon? Sour. <laughs> your body turned sour. <laughs> did, did anything happen in anybody's body? Cringed. You noticed yeah. you cringed? Yeah. Did anyone notice that they salivated? Yeah, so you actually activate some of those glands that taste sour. You could feel them right behind your ears and in I your neck. Yeah. You could really smell it. Really smell it, yeah. You looked like you were smiling when you were smelling it. Um, and so, some people said they did have the extra salivation. Did anyone experience that? Yeah. And what did you say? I was smelling my orange peels. <laughs> <laughs> your, your body was confused. You were like, I don't know if this is a lemon or an orange or a cross. That's funny. Yeah, a lot of times people say, why can't you use an orange for that? That's horrible. <laughs> but the lemon does make Did you have something you wanted to add? Well, when I concentrated on that, the rest of my body. Ah, so you really noticed a relaxation response in the rest of your body, just focusing on the lemon. The lemon tends to have a strong response because it does have a strong flavor. And the beauty of that is that that was like 30 seconds. That was no time at all. And um, you had a physiological response in your body, and there was no lemon here. It was just a focus, just a way of focusing our mind. So we can imagine that with that 30 seconds of focus, what could happen in you know, much more deliberate, longer focus? So another place that we can use our mind to break the symptom cycle is at that place of tense muscles. Tense muscles really has a big impact on lots of other 
parts of our sense of well-being. So one of the techniques they teach on tense muscles, well, does anyone here have a technique you use for tense muscles? Tennis balls. Oh, there's a neat one, tennis balls. Anything else? Anyone heard of, yeah? Just recognizing that, that you have them. Yeah. I thought you were going to say fear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I changed it. <laughs> Fear is a really good strategy for tense muscles. Yeah. Recognizing it. Yeah. Recognizing and consciously relaxing them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I lay flat on the floor and I feel like I don't notice anything. Yeah. Just try and visualize melting kind of into the floor. Mm -hmm. It kind of makes everything let go. Yeah. Sometimes that works, especially right in here. So is there a lot of tension with the neck? It's not ever going to touch the floor unless you're stressing and making it. If you visualize that you're all one, it kind of works for me. That's beautiful. That's a really neat technique. And and then I heard the other one, just notice. Who said just noticing? That was you. Yeah. Just noticing the mindfulness, as you mentioned you mentioned before. You know, just bringing your awareness to different parts of the body. Um, so there's a few different techniques that can be used. One is the body scan which is just a really basic bringing awareness to, you know, starting at one part of your body all the way down and just noticing what's already there. And, and just by noticing, we don't have to do anything about it. It'll change. It'll just start to soften, just noticing it usually. Another is progressive muscle relaxation, which is where you kind of progressively go through and you relax, like starting at your head or your feet, and you go all the way through the body, noticing tension and then relaxing it. Um, you know, just to give an example of that, uh, if you want to, like, put your hands out and, you know, either make a fist or you want to do this with me right now? Really? Just, like, kind of make a ten hold some tension in your hands, really bring your fingertips up, just hold it, hold it, hold it up. And then, um, in a minute, then just kind of let it go. And you might feel like it even relaxes more than it was before. So sometimes the progressive muscle relaxation involves tensing things if they're not already painful and then relaxing them throughout the whole body. So there's a few different great techniques. Any other ones that you can think of? Yeah. Mine is, I think, of 10 deep breaths. And I concentrate on that, you know, yeah. breathing in, in out, you yeah. know, so it's all in here. Yeah. And that relax. Yeah, that kind of goes, in my mind, a little bit with the melting, like, yeah. You know, when you open and relax parts, you just have to kind of think about it with your mind and your body actually responds to that. So those are a couple examples of some things that we can do with our mind to affect our body. And I guess the, I'm going to do a, a few more self-management techniques before we break. I know it's close to lunchtime and you're probably hungry. Um, but, you know, living with a chronic health condition, it's, just, it's alluring to try to find a cure, just try to find something that will help. So there's always this quest I, I you know, experience and trying to find something out there. And so looking for alternatives is good. Like we said before, trying new things is important. However, it also is important to ask ourselves some critical questions. And being a good self-manager means being able to ask ourselves these critical questions before trying a new treatment. So the first question is, where did you learn about this? You know, was it a supermarket tabloid or a scientific journal? Was it from the doctor or was it from your neighbor? Um, and not that there's any wrong answers to that. You know, the tabloid or your neighbor could be right. But it is important to evaluate where you heard it from. Next, were the people who got better like you? You know, are they of the same? Everyone, many in the room may have FMD, but doesn't mean that one thing that works for a 25-year-old female will work for, you know, a 48-year-old female or a male to female. So considering, was the person who got better like you if you heard about someone having improvement from the treatment? Could anything else have caused their positive changes or the positive changes that are reported? Like the seasons. People get happier in different seasons. I'm a spring person, personally. Other medications they might be taking. Emotional changes. Relationship changes. Does the treatment suggest stopping any other medication or treatment? So, you know, if other things that one is doing is working, then it's important to consider if I try this treatment and I have to stop this, there's an importance to weighing that cost-benefit. Does the treatment suggest not eating a well-balanced diet? Has anyone ever experimented with nutritional ways to treat themselves? <laughs> yeah, a couple people. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. I do all the time. I'm 
Brazilians, so we do vegetables and fruits all day, every day. So yeah, yeah, and you know, to some food can be medicine. It's certainly a way of looking at things, it but is. it is. It is. I have several when the blood pressure goes up. I have something that I make, and I don't need to take any medication. I just do just food. Yeah. So there are lots of techniques, and it's important to consider, does this technique involve not having a well-balanced diet? Because we know that the body needs a wide variety of vitamins and minerals to function well. It's a consideration. Um, can you think of any possible dangers or harms? So in this one, I like to remind, I'm, I tend to go towards a natural route when I can, but natural isn't always better, and that's important to remember. After all, hemlock is natural, you know, and it's probably, you know, going to kill you. So natural, and, and they're not often regulated as well in the United States, the natural remedies and supplements. So it is important to consider that when thinking of um, natural. Natural can be really good, like the foxglove plant creates digitalis, a heart medication. But, um, you know, it has to be prescribed in certain dosages. So it's something to consider about what are the possible dangers of, or harms. And then finally, after asking these questions, it's really good critical thinking to ask, are you willing to go to the trouble or expense? And it's not just you know financially, it's emotionally, physically, to whatever a new treatment might be. Or do you have the necessary supports in place? So these are all important parts of self-management that we've gone over today. Um, and remember to try to keep these in mind next time you hear of a new treatment or consider something new for you. I've just touched on this program. Has anyone heard of the Chronic Disease Self-Management Program? Where, um, who lives, you have, because you contact me. Who lives in the southeast here? Oh, most of you. A lot of you. Where else are you from? Michigan. Oh, you're from Michigan. Good. And did you, were you, you were, yeah. I'm from Minneapolis. And you're from Minneapolis, okay. Well, the good news about this sort of program, chronic disease self-management program, is it's everywhere in the United States. Um, you usually can find, it's maybe under a different name, they're usually disseminated through the area agencies on aging, but they're not just for people who are, well, we're all aging, so I guess I'll include it. But they're not just, you know, there's no certain age. I wanted to give you an overview of the sort of things that are covered in the class. There's usually no charge or a very small charge. And the fun part is it's just like a positive place to share moving forward and well-being. Sure. You'll see on here, it just shows what's covered each week. And um, I just want to point awareness to, you know, there's certainly healthy eating and all those sorts of things, medication usage, making informed decisions, but also things like communication skills. Um, that's down there, you know, in the bottom third. And you mentioned relationships. You know, we don't go through this in a vacuum. We don't live alone as we go through living a life with a chronic health condition or anything. We, we have partners and relationships. And that one has saved me so many times. Even though there's things I think I know, remembering them and kind of having accountability on taking charge of our health and well-being is a really important part of self-management. So finally, you'll notice every week they have this thing called making an action plan. And that's like your weekly small goal that moves you through the week and just gives you a focus other than the disease. The action plan is fun because it's not something you have to do. It's something you want to do. It's not something that other people tell you to do. So how often in life do you just get to say, what do I want to do this week? And just, this is my goal. It's what I want to do. That it's reasonable that you can actually expect to achieve that. That it's behavior specific so that you know if you did it or not. For example, what is it you're going to do, how much of it, when, and how often. And that your confidence level that you'll be totally successful in doing it is a 7 or more on a scale of 0 to 10. So for example, for me this week, I really need to do some stress reduction. And I know that sitting by the creek where I live, I have creek on my property, and just journaling for a few minutes is like really good for me. And so this week what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit by the creek just for 10 minutes or so. 10 minutes is how much. When I know I'm going to do it twice this week, how often um, and when. I don't know which days because I would have to look at my calendar. Today will probably be one of them. My confidence level is an 8, I'm going to do it. And because I told you all that I'm going to do it, I'm really going to do it. So now I want to invite each of you to make your own action plan for this week. I'm going to give you a place you can write it down if you'd like. It's 2, 3. And um, it, I just encourage you to actually tell each other, like maybe, 
pair up in a group of two and tell each other what you're going to do for your well-being that you want to do this week. And that's what we'll end with. Take a few minutes. It'll be easy to do because you always make a little bit of it. Even for caregivers, everybody else <laughs> Just what I There you go. Even for you, you get to do something you want to do. Thanks for saying that. Yeah, from a zero to a ten, how confident are you that you'll complete the whole plan? We, it should be a seven or more, or it's probably not a reasonable plan. That's kind of your indicator that it's you're probably not going to be successful if it's lower than a seven. Mine is a ten. It's a ten. <laughs> how exciting! Okay, wait just a minute, and we'll hear what yours is. <laughs> You know, you're really doing something you want to do when it's a 10. Okay, it looks like most people have got it. Did anyone not get one? Oh, wow, that's great. Anyone want to share what theirs is? Do you want to share what yours is? Mine is swimming. It's swimming? How many times are you going to swim? Everything. And how long are you going to swim for? Oh, I see uh, as long as the sign is there because I like to cook. Uh huh. So, so every day? Yeah, every day I do the same thing. Uh -huh. uh, exactly at 1 p.m., I put my bathing suit on. And I go to the pool, and I can't come back inside of five o'clock. <laughs> and uh, did anyone else make an action plan of something they don't normally do? Yeah, Sarah, what'd you do? Um, I have to practice a speech that has slides, and that projector is rented through Wednesday. Oh. <laughs> so I'm going to use that projector at home to practice. And how many times are you going to do that? Um, at least daily, Monday through Wednesday, and then in my head after that, probably. And how confident were you that you'd be successful? Like yeah, you're. <laughs> you can do it. You've got an accountability buddy too. Anybody else want to share theirs? Yeah. Um, I'm gonna ride my bike, and then when I come out today, I'm gonna walk all day, and I'm gonna. Oh, that sounds great. I want to go with you. <laughs> All of those things. <laughs> yeah? I don't want to get up with Dr. Engelbrecht to find his sister's routine, dance routine, that doesn't make her feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great and, one. And I'm going to be, we're going on a trip, so I'm going to miss my water aerobics class. Yeah. And so I'm going to try and do it either if the hotel pool is open in a hotel pool. Or if not, I'm not even trying to 
Oh, wow, so you're going to replace your water exercise with doing it either in the yeah. pool or the ocean. Because it's all habit. It's all habit. Once you get in the habit, and you can't break your head. <laughs> How confident are you that you'll be able to get that water routine in? Um, seven. Seven. I mean, it's good. You know when you're at a seven, you're pushing yourself, but you're confident enough yeah, that you're probably going to do it. Yeah, it depends on the weather and the pool. And it depends yeah. on the things just to make it out. There's something. Anybody else? Did you raise your hand, Heather? I've been very, very slowly trying to create a customized nutrition plan for one of my friends at work, and I'm going to finish that this week. Awesome. <laughs> try to do it. Yeah. Are you going to try to do it, or are you going to do it? I'm seven. I'm Okay, <laughs> you're going to do it. Anybody else? Well, thank you all so much for just entertaining the whole self-management, the compliment to clinical care. Um, it's really nice to have spent some time with you. I hope you enjoy the rest of the presentations. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. And that will actually bring us to a wrap for the morning session. We're just now barely into the afternoon. And so we all get to have lunch together out in the atrium. You should all have gotten with your name tags a card that is red or green. Take that with you and put it next to your drink and they will bring you food accordingly. And Mingle, sit wherever you want, and enjoy. We'll be back soon. Does anyone want more information on chronic disease?